Some call it the UFO leak of the century. Others refer to it as the Wilson Davis documents. And some just call it a downright hoax. These 15 pages, which were uploaded by an anonymous account to a popular image sharing site, chronicle a secret meeting in Las Vegas where a massive cover-up was revealed by a former high-ranking military intelligence official. As the story goes, Admiral Thomas Wilson met with physicist Dr. Eric W. Davis, and it was during this meeting that the Admiral revealed secret alien technology being tested within the private sector. We do. Wilson, a former J-2 director for intelligence in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that although he verified that the alien tech was real and hidden within the private sector, he was denied access to it and his career was threatened if he continued to pursue it. At least, that's the story, as revealed in these notes. But is any of it real? Or is this all an elaborate work of fiction, concocted by an unknown hoaxer? My guest today believes this document leak represents an extremely important and potentially groundbreaking situation that was never supposed to be seen by the public. His name is Jay, and he runs Project Unity. Jay aims to build what he calls an intellectual space for the free flow of ideas on disruptive issues, from physics to metaphysics, theology, and philosophy. And it is within this platform where he has spent hours upon hours creating video content on all sorts of topics, including the Wilson Davis documents. And he believes they very well may be real. What evidence is there that makes him think that's a possibility? Well, we're about to find out together. Stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., founder and creator of TheBlackVault.com. And today, I'm revisiting a topic that I've done a couple videos on, talked to a couple guests about, and well, I kind of lean towards maybe these documents just aren't genuine. But my guest today, I think it's safe to say, feels quite differently uh, than I do. Now, Jay from Project Unity. Thank you so much for taking the time, joining me and my audience. I'm always, always, always eager to challenge what I put out there, and I want to make sure my audience has all of the information. So thank you for taking the time today. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me, John. You know, I, I, I really do appreciate an opportunity to have a sensible conversation about this. And, uh, you know, I think some of your listeners will be aware of the fact that you and I have had some disagreements on the Wilson documents in the past uh, in a public format. And, uh, and I'll be the first to admit that I didn't always keep my cool on Twitter, which is difficult. Uh, but I just want to say that, you know, regardless of differences between us with the, uh, the Wilson documents, I've always respected what you've done with the Black Vault. It's an incredible library of information. You know, it really is. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I think we're going to have a productive conversation. So again, thank you for, uh, for inviting me. It's my pleasure. And thankfully, I always keep my cool on Twitter. So I know I'm <laughs> oh, kidding. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, uh, I have Thanks. fallen into those trenches. <laughs> I, I, I've fallen into those trenches too, so I get it. Yeah. No worries. Uh, but what where I where I want to start is obviously a little bit of of your background. What what I must say up front is that I truly appreciate, and which is why I wanted to invite you on to talk about this topic, is that you seem so genuine and passionate about what you do. And, and really digging in, which I can appreciate. And, and that's where I felt that we would have a great conversation. So that's where I want to start, is your background. You started Project Unity. Uh, tell everybody who is not aware of it, what exactly is that? Yeah, well, I mean, it all just, you know, I, I could have never predicted that I would end up doing this, to be honest. You know, I, I just kind of fell into this. 
because and there's a there's a long backstory really to me starting project unity and a lot of it does come down to the more consciousness related issues of the phenomenon and uh, you know i have had my own um experiences i haven't ever had you know communications or downloads but i have had experiences i have seen things in the sky and uh, and that really did actually catalyze my interest in wanting to dive into this subject you know i've only been around for a few years i started paying attention around 2017 like a lot of people you know when the new york times story came out and things started to uh, pick up the pace so i've only been invested in this for a short period of time but within that time I've been very fortunate, you know, I put out a couple of, it was actually, funnily enough, the Wilson documents that springboarded me into having an ability to network with a few different people. Because before then, I was just uploading random things that I felt were important. And I was doing a few different little videos, just me basically in the forest, far away from civilization, talking about this stuff to a camera, because I just didn't want to be uh, overheard talking about this kind of issue at, at the beginning. Um, but it evolved, you know, it, I, I was lucky enough to get interested in the Wilson documents and I actually put out a little trailer for a for a kind of a project that I was thinking of doing, which I'm actually still in the plans of making and it's starting to develop and adapt a little more than when I first decided to make it. But I put out this trailer and uh, Richard Dolan and a few other people took notice of that. And weirdly enough, that was where I managed to get my foot in the door of connecting with a few different people. And um, <clears throat> sorry, let me just get a drink of water because I'm talking very quickly. No worries. Uh, I just want to make sure I don't fall over my words. <laughs> no worries. <clears throat> it's always the same when I start off, whether I'm interviewing someone or being interviewed, I always find that I'm talking too quickly. No, you're doing great. But um, yeah, to, to get back to it, essentially, <laughs> I was I was able to get in contact with Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Kane. And that's because of a, a colleague of mine that Richard Dolan introduced me to, who had a lot of knowledge on the Wilson documents. And we put together this kind of big breakdown. And literally within 24 hours of doing that breakdown, we got contacted by Ralph and Leslie, and they were very interested. So th there was a few different things that happened from that that allowed me to basically secure the first interview with uh, Ralph and Leslie when they put out their latest, uh, uh, I can't remember which article it was. It wasn't obviously the first article, it was one in 2018, but they gave me permission to have the first interview. And that kind of put me on the map for a few different people. It was the most viewed interview I'd ever had. Like I had, I had like, you know, a, a thousand views on my videos, like maybe just over a thousand views. And this one got 20,000 within like a, you know, a few weeks. So it was a big uptick for me. And, uh, and that's where people became aware of uh, my channel a little bit more. But yeah, I, I kind of try and I, I really try and broaden the conversation to involve consciousness and nuts and bolts, because I think these are very important things that should be maybe more symbiotically approached and not necessarily uh, seen as bifurcations and, you know, two different subjects that should be ignored from each other. I think that there's a very complementary aspect to the physical and the non-physical aspects of this conversation so i try and bring it all together as much as i can by just having different people on you know talk about the nuts and bolts talk about the consciousness talk about all the, the different issues that i find to be interesting and uh, and so i'm, I'm just trying to provide a, a platform so that i can learn and that and through that other people can learn because I, I don't pr pretend to be an authority on on any of this especially the wilson leaks i don't pretend to be an authority on it but I've just been fortunate enough to have conversations with people, network with people, and uh, yeah, I've, I've I've been able to solidify myself as a as a as a member of the UFO community in terms of as a, as a researcher, as a platform, as a as a channel. And uh, yeah, yeah, if you'd if you'd have gone back in time and asked me a few years ago if I'd be doing this, I would have said absolutely not. But here I am, and uh, and I'm happy to be here tonight. I think, and I'm happy to have you. I, I think we all feel that way. You know, yeah. we, we can all comfortably say, yeah, if you asked me 10 years ago, now right. I have to say, if you asked me 25 years ago, uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting up there in age, but uh, I think we all feel that way. We never expect it, yeah. but that's what happens to us. Uh, one really interesting note for, for the audience, which was a very cool little, little tidbit of synchronicity was doing research for for all shows that I do, but I always love to kind of see what the guest likes, you know, gear interviews towards their interests. Obviously, we have a, a pretty tight niche of what we're dealing with yeah. uh, here, but I wanted to really get into Project Unity and see what you did. And not only do you do interviews, you do uh, videos, you do audio only stuff. Uh, so you have a, a wide array. So I would recommend everybody check it out. Links are in the description below directly to Project Unity. Make sure uh, that you subscribe. But one of the videos you had was a show that I had produced for History Channel about <laughs> Hitler and the occult. 
And I, I was like, wait a minute, what? Because again, with our, you know, kind of rough start to our history a couple of years back, I thought, what is that? What is this? So I had to, to say like, oh my God, that was my, that was my baby for, for a while. And forgive me, I misspoke. It was National Geographic Channel, not history. Uh, but, but it was an amazing little thing of, of synchronicity there that you had pulled that clip. And I remember writing that segment. I remember the actor. I was friends with him for years who played, who actually played uh, Adolf Hitler in that show. And it was an amazing <laughs> thing. So it was fun to kind of see that synchronicity that I think we have a lot more in common uh, than we might have imagined originally. So yeah. let me take you, let me take you back to the, the Wilson Davis documents, because you have done a lot of work doing the videos and researching. And I would respectfully disagree. I think you are an authority. When I asked on Twitter, who out there, you know, is somebody we, we should talk to about this, because I wanted to revisit. Most of the people said you, there was a short list of people, uh, you know, you were you were on that list. So you're, you're definitely an authority. No <laughs> What's that? No pressure. No pressure. So, uh, so don't mess, don't mess this up, Jay. Uh, no, I, uh, but I, I wanted to say that just simply because you, you have done that research and that, even though we may not agree at the end, but who knows, uh, by the end of this, you've done that work. So I, uh, that I can appreciate, but what made you look at the Wilson Davis documents? I mean, if you walked up to somebody on the street and they go, what's the Wilson Davis documents? Why have you, why do you want to bring attention to that? What would you say? Um, well, I came across it. I, I think I think the main thing that I saw first of all was actually Richard Dolan's uh, video when he put out that first the leak of the century uh, presentation. I'm pretty sure that was my first time being exposed to the notes. Maybe slightly before then, maybe someone has sent me a link to where it was hosted on uh, on Imga or Imger or whatever you call it. Um, yeah, but uh, but yeah, yeah for that Jeff. Was yeah yeah that was when i first became aware of the documents and uh <clears throat> you know i just i downloaded them i was reading through them and i think what interested me was that i before i'd properly embedded myself in the ufo conversation like i said i started in consciousness and uh one of the things i started in was kind of going through i think you'll appreciate this the cia freedom of information at libraries just trying to find anything i can on you know, uh, mysterious physics, exotic uh, concepts, and you know, and I was finding a lot of this remote viewing stuff and Stanford Research Institute and Hal Puttoff, and so I was hearing mention of these people, and I had seen interviews with people like Edgar Mitchell when he was first talking about this issue, but I hadn't at that time before I was, uh, you know, before I saw the notes, I hadn't threaded these people together in that way. So when I saw the notes and they were all being mentioned within it, and you had you know Greer and you had Miller and Mitchell. I was just like, okay, I'm interested in this. And uh, I, at the time, like I said, I just kind of wanted to, I think what I, what I was planning to do at the beginning, once I decided that this was interesting enough to go through was I was gonna do like a dramatized reading of the notes. Um, so I was kind of writing out like a script almost where I fleshed out. Script? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm just trying to, <laughs> I was, had to. It was actually me all along, John. It's my script <laughs> I dropped it years ago. I'm uh, I'm older than I look. No, no, <laughs> no. But uh, seriously, I was looking at writing like kind of like a more fleshed out version of it, so that I could read it in a in a dramatized way, but still have all of the necessary you know components of the notes included. And I never really got around to doing that, and it's evolved into something else that I'm looking to do now. But um, yeah, that's where my interest started, and so I put out this little promotional video for those notes and like I said I got connected to Richard Dolan and a few other people and and now I'm uh you know very good friends with James Rigney and and Ross Coltart and a few of the others who've been involved in this uh in this research effort and I just I just think that it it's worthy it's it's I, I honestly think it's worthy of trying to keep this within the conversation and not let it gather dust in the attic and just become a long forgotten story I would never say that everything in that document is 100% real and I know that as a fact because that would be really arrogant and it's not true. I don't know that, I just don't. But I do think that this represents a potential situation where you've got a, a, a very clear indication of, uh, of subversion of standardized governmental oversight on programs. You've got very you know compelling information about the idea that they are keeping very sensitive technologies and, and materials away from the public in relation to UFOs and potentially extraterrestrials, we don't know. Um, so I just think that 
when you look at other areas of this research effort, it's not like this is the only example uh, that is hinting towards hidden programs and black programs and reverse engineering. We've got you know quite a few different examples. Um, one that I would like to highlight because it was actually in my recent interview with Ross Coltart, and I think a, a lot of people now know about this example is uh, is the former director of the U.S. Navy Science and Technology Division, Nat Kobitz, and he was interviewed by. Uh, Ross, who, who who met him, the man was unfortunately dying of cancer, and uh, and he he did confirm to Ross on the uh, you know when he was speaking with him that he had been involved, he'd been read into and briefed on retrieval and reengineering programs, that he was shown very anomalous metals because he kind of uh, you know was he was the head honcho of the science and tech division of the U.S. Navy, he had a lot of uh, uh, bona fides in in that in that kind of uh, subject matter, so we we've got lots of different converging possibilities that this stuff's real. And I just think that the Admiral Wilson leaks is one of those areas which should perhaps be scrutinized more. And, and just I just don't want to see it left alone and, and fade away from memory. I, I, you know, it's, it's not like we can break the door open with this right now, but I think that developments are still possible in the future with this. If we keep it going, if we keep asking questions, if we keep bringing it up and going, hey, but what about this? Can you answer this question about these leaks? Maybe one day we'll get an, another notch up on the development ladder. But uh, yeah, I just don't want to see it stay as a static situation in, in the shadows of ufology, you know? Sure. Yeah, no, I understand that. Um, we don't have to go through every like bullet point of the Wilson Davis documents just because you have done an extensive overview of it uh, on my channel. I've done, you know, minus the theory, which we'll get into later uh, in extensive overview. Uh, so I kind of want to move forward with the understanding the audience who's watching this probably has a rough overview of what the notes are. But let me ask you, though, what do you feel out of the notes is <coughs> the most important part that you feel shouldn't be lost you know, to, to history, but what, what is that one thing that you take away from the notes? Unfortunately, there isn't, it's not about one thing. It's about a coalescing of data. It's about a compounding of information. It's about chronological, uh, historical context of statements made by various people involved. So, I mean, I, I can't give you one smoking gun, the actual document itself, I would consider to be a smoking gun, but that's because of all of the information outside of it. It's not just ink on paper there are statements from people involved edgar mitchell eric davis hal puts off you know there were there were interesting comments and and interesting events that transpired so i you know i <laughs> like i said i've got a lot of notes here i don't want to have to take up the whole time going for every single one but i i do have quite a few different things i'd like to go through i mean to sure. be honest uh, you know, the first thing that I think is worth mentioning uh, is Edgar Mitchell, right? So Apollo Apollo 14 astronaut, sixth man to walk on the moon, uh, you know, incredibly intelligent and an honorable man. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, what we know about these documents, we know they came from a rep reputable source. It's an absolute fact that these documents were rescued from Edgar Mitchell's estate by a close friend after Edgar passed away because his family were looking to get rid of many of his files, you know, and um, <clears throat> this friend who is known to two of my colleagues, James Rigney and, and Ross Coltart, discovered the documents. And I think most people who have looked into this situation know the chronology of the, the events from here. They went from the friend of Edgar Mitchell to James Rigney, from James Rigney to Grant Cameron, and through a small group connected to Grant, eventually they were leaked online. Um, now, I think it's also worth mentioning, to be fair, that these were not the only UFO-related documents in Edgar's files, which is not a massive surprise, but Ross Coltart was permitted to be the primary archivist of Edgar's files by his family friend who wishes to remain anonymous, uh, you know, and there are good reasons for that. And th there is far more in Edgar's archives than just the Wilson documents, but these documents, I think, are the most explicit in relation to potential cover-ups and sensitive programs, right? So. I think that what's important to remember is that Edgar Mitchell was in a key position within Robert Bigelow's research group, the, the National Institute of Discovery Science, better known as NIDS. And, uh, you know, Edgar was on, on the advisory board member of NIDS alongside both Dr. Eric W. Davis and Dr. Hal Putoff. Um, so the very idea that this transcript between Eric and the Admiral would be circulated amongst the core group of, of, a high, of highly qualified individuals within the advisory board of a an institute that was essentially dedicated to uncovering the truth around paranormal and UFO related issues. This, uh, you know, the, the Institute of NIDS, it's extremely likely that these individuals um, 
would actually communicate and trust each other on something like this. You know, they were for the most part all holding security clearances and they knew how to keep a secret. So the idea that um, Eric would share this information with the likes of, for example, Edgar Mitchell or Hal Putoff is not outrageous. Uh, you know, in fact, it's extremely likely, in my opinion, that this was even, uh, and, and it's outlined in the notes. When Admiral Wilson asks Eric uh, what he intends to do with the notes, to which Eric responds that he'll be using it for private research efforts to better, uh, I think he says, understand the signal to noise ratio within ufology. So I think Eric circulating these documents amongst trusted colleagues within NIDS is very likely. Um, but um, yeah, there's there's a few different points I've got on Edgar Mitchell, so I want sure. to give you a chance to can, respond. Can, can I can I just yeah. jump in? I, I'm you Absolutely. have all the time you want, uh, but I want to just ask a question on that because uh, this is something I'm curious about. Yeah, is there anybody, including the friend that's not named forward, that can speak to the context of why Edgar Mitchell had these notes in his archive? Uh, right. Let me just unpack that question. So, is there any is there anyone who's what come out on the record that can attest? To right. They they can say, and 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 this will kind of lead into other questions. But I don't want to yeah. take away from what you want to go through. So I'm not trying to derail that. Of course, of course. Uh, but where I'm going, go where I'm going with this is this is a silly example in in my archive. Right. I've got a National Enquirer article that was obtained through the Freedom of Information Act from the National Security Agency. Right. Does that mean that I believe that that National Enquirer article is real? No, of course not. But the context of why I have it is the story. That's right. where I'm curious. Right. Like, why did Mitchell have these? Like, can somebody really okay. say okay. Well, that Eric Davis gave <clears throat> him the I notes? Think, I think I think that um, the best person to refer back to is Edgar Mitchell himself, because he does confirm that there was a report generated much later than the phone calls that they received from Admiral Wilson that confirmed his denial of access, that they received a report much later than that that confirmed the legitimacy of the Admiral's denial of access. So, yeah, I mean, obviously you don't have direct Eric said this, but it seems to be implying that there was some level of extensive report about the Admiral's situation that was then given to members of the NID circle, which, as I highlighted before, they were all in this trusted network of trying to figure out the truth about this situation and, and situations like this. Also, I, I and I, I'll acknowledge that I can't remember the source, but I know that he did say this. Ed Edgar Mitchell did say that a colleague of his interviewed Admiral Wilson in Las Vegas. That is an on-record statement that can be found online. I can't remember exactly where. Um, I'd be happy to try and find it after the fact and post it on Twitter for anyone interested. But uh, uh, yeah, and I won't just <clears throat> not to step on you. I won't dispute that. I I believe that it was UFO Joe's blog, and Probably. I believe that the insinuation was that. Eric Day, and I think it goes to, well, I, I actually, I don't want to misspeak. I thought it was Hal Putoff saying that one of his colleagues had interviewed and they felt that Hal Putoff had uh, slipped up when he gave that comment that well, one I've of his. Got, I, I've got that comment as well here. And I'll so you're talking about something different. Okay. Anything so then I didn't want to misspeak. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm sure UFO Joe would probably have it on his fantastic, uh, very, very long breakdown of the of the Wilson notes on his blog, so people can have a look through there. I will try and find this because I don't want to say something and then not be able to back it up. But I sure. do remember uh, there was a quote from uh, from Edgar Mitchell where he did say, didn't say Eric, but he said a colleague of his went to Las Vegas and interviewed the Admiral. So um, you know, I just think I just think that. Usually, I wouldn't base it so loosely on just someone else's uh, statements, but we're talking about Edgar Mitchell, and he's a special boy, <laughs> you know, because he's a very honorable, honorable man. He's a very, he's he had a lot of integrity, a lot of intelligence, a lot of patriotism, and a lot of passion for this subject. And, uh, and I just, I just can't envision him saying things like this if it wasn't represents of a situation that he was very very familiar with he wouldn't go on record about it uh, i mean for you know uh, there's there's actually a good example of this if he absolutely knew he shouldn't go on record about something or if he absolutely felt that it wasn't necessary to do so he wouldn't do it and one example of that which was actually recently brought to light is uh, the fact that he's always on record, well, not always, but very frequently on record, started it by saying, I just want to preface that I myself have never seen a UFO. That's not true. He did see a UFO, and he didn't say it because of national security restrictions, because he was a NASA astronaut. And uh, and so I think that, you know, he's someone who chooses his words very carefully. 
Uh, and I think that when it comes to talking about a situation as delicate as this, I just I just think that Edgar Mitchell can be relied on as, as quite a strong voice of reason. And uh, and he has made some very significant hints towards Eric being the one who went out and interviewed sure. this person. So, yes, you're right. There's no direct naming, but I just... Uh, yeah. Uh, I do want to add one thing because I get a lot of heat from this and this may have, I don't remember, but it may have been, you know, part of the rift between you and I regarding Edgar Mitchell. Uh, I met Edgar Mitchell quite a few times, uh, had dinner with him, uh, spoken <laughs> at conferences with him, shared stages with him. Uh, I believe I was on a panel with him. If I remember correctly, I could be wrong on the panel part, uh, but regardless, there's pictures of me on stage with him. And the reason why I bring that up is I am not attacking Edgar Mitchell. He is an American hero. You know, the space program is something that, that uh, I'm a huge fan of. My father worked within it. So I'm very sensitive about those types of things. But in the same respect, and this that all leads into my question to you, is you're absolutely right. He's an honorable man, right? And, and you're absolutely right. His intentions, I, I believe, are pure. I, I, I had no... Uh, bad feeling. I get bad feelings about a lot of people. Edgar Mitchell was not one of them. But my question is, is it possible that he was told that this was true and was too trusting by whomever told him? I don't believe so, because this was something that very clearly seems to have been circulated amongst the core group of NIDs. And I do have details about why I believe that it was absolutely circulated amongst the core group. And this this group did not have within their you know uh, network the possibility for a, a falsified script about one of their members to be circulated amongst this group and then later spoken about, uh, essentially, by Edgar Mitchell on uh, on TV. So... I, I don't think that that's the case because I think that there's relatively good evidence to suggest that Eric Davis did indeed write these notes, and including, and you know what? Because uh, I like I said, I've got a lot of notes here, but I'll yeah skip yeah yeah go for it. I think it's relevant for what we're talking about right now. Hal put off right. Um, <laughs> he's given some interesting comments in respect to Admiral Wilson leaks because whether it was a slip of the tongue or a deliberate delicate and cleverly worded response Hal Putoff confirmed that Eric Davis met with and interviewed Admiral Wilson now I will say that Hal Putoff has made comments about this claiming that he was merely reciting the question back for the audience but I don't think his wording makes this very likely because do you, I've do you have the that. quote in front of you I that you can read me. here is what Hal Putoff said during the Q&A session of the transition talk conference that took place in February of 2020 he said, <clears throat> this is a question about the Wilson documents that apparently got leaked on the internet. Admiral Wilson was one of the Joint Chiefs of Staff interviewed by my senior scientist colleague, Eric Davis. Since it discusses potentially ongoing programs, I have no comment. Now, that first section, this, this is a question about the Wilson documents that apparently got leaked on the internet. That part's absolutely nothing other than Hal Putoff reciting back the question to the audience. But the next part doesn't read in a way that sounds like he's reciting it back. Hal Putoff says, Admiral Wilson was one of the Joint Chiefs of Staff interviewed by my senior scientist colleague. Not Admiral Wilson was supposed to be one of. He li literally says Admiral Wilson was. And uh, it just doesn't seem like he's reciting here. It sounds like he's telling you that Eric interviewed the Admiral. And, and then he finishes off with saying he won't discuss it because it relates to potentially ongoing programs. I mean, you know, I kind of feel like he's he's trying to be as clear as he can. This is not a simple no comment. This is a linguistically strategized statement that allows Hal to acknowledge the fact that this occurred without directly saying it and therefore negating any breaches in national security. Okay. I, I mean, what's tough about that is we are reading into potentially what he could or could not have meant. And I think that that's what's very challenging about Absolutely. statements like that. But I'm glad that you had the, the quote because I wanted to make sure that we had that, you know, I exact. Yeah. Other than that, though, Hal Putoff has has primarily given no comments. He gave one to uh, uh, James Iandoli uh, mm -hmm. engaging the phenomenon. That was the one that I was able to source for the the video that I did. But I know he's given that quite a quite a few times. Yeah. Um. I'm kind of jumping around in my head on the questions, but since we're on no comments, I, I just want to throw this question out. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I just want to say real quick, sorry, John, but That's okay. I, like, I'm, I'm sure that most people are aware that, uh, you know, Richard Dolan was provided two pages of the notes way back in the early 2000s. 
uh, by someone very closely associated with NIDS and to the Stars Academy. And when these documents were publicly leaked, this, this same individual confirmed to Richard off the record that the documents are legitimate. So obviously take what you will from anonymity, but I respect Richard Dolan and I know he is telling the truth about this individual, both providing him with a, a small portion of the documents early on and uh, and then also confirming their legitimacy when the leaks occurred. And, you know, he remains nameless, but I think people can fill in the blanks here. You, you Well, you answered my question. So, so just for clarity, we don't know who that is. I would rather not comment on that. So you, okay. So you possibly know who that is. I'm talking about the collective. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. The public. collective doesn't know. Me. I have yeah. no idea who that is. Yeah, <laughs> so. I don't know. I know but that's why, that's why I'm saying take anonymity from it, what you will, but I respect. I gotcha. Him, and I yeah, appreciate yeah. his work ethic and his honesty in this. So. Okay. And, uh, and, and to be fair, real quick, Kit Green also spoke with Richard Dolan. You know, he gave him an on record comment about the Wilson documents, but he gave Richard permission to say publicly that Kit Green also gave him an off record comment about these leaks. So again, take from that what you will, but all of this pushes the needle further towards this being legit because these people don't want to acknowledge this publicly for very obvious reasons. But seems so to be what was, what was the off record part of that? We don't know. It was off record, but he's he's he gave an on record statement. I can't remember specifically what that statement was, but um, yeah, because I was you know I was speaking with Richard Dolan recently about it, and he said, yeah, you know what, well, Kit Green gave me an on record statement, and then said after they got off record, well, I can give you I can give you an off record statement. Or Richard Dolan asked him, and he he agreed, and then Richard did ask him, can I say that you gave me an off record statement? And Kit Green said yes. So, but we have no we, idea what the off record stuff is. But, I mean, I obviously it's off record, but all, all I'm saying is it's just like, like, why would you need to give an off record statement or why would any of these people need to give off record statements that apparently uh, they can't give publicly? And especially when they haven't actually denied it publicly anyway, like Howell's never denied it. Eric's never denied it. So it's, it's well, I, okay. And, and I want to, and I want to zone in on that since that br was brought up here, uh, because I think that that is one thing that is brought up a lot. Mm. May I ask, and, and really quickly, and then I'll, I'll expand a little bit more, yep. have you ever spoken to anyone with a security clearance outside of the UFO sphere? Meaning, you know, you probably have talked to Hal Putoff, it sounds like. Uh, obviously, he, he likely either had or has a security clearance, whatever the answer is. But outside, have you interviewed anybody and asked them about security classification? classification and how they handle talking about uh, classified information? No, not specifically. I don't think I have. Okay. So I, because I don't know, I don't have a security clearance and so on. So I reached out to a small handful of those that do have security clearances. Um, I can say there are a couple of them that are inside uh, the Pentagon currently working now and one that is for a contractor. Uh, in short, I asked them, what happens when you have a classified question posed your way? Meaning if I, if I hold up a document and I say, okay, this is allegedly top secret and they have a top secret clearance. Can you tell me if this is real or not? And, and I didn't, you know, it's not a UFO document. I'm just saying anything of classification and across the board, everybody said, no, you never comment on it. And the legality is the fact that you are now acting as a spokesperson for the United States government, even as silly as that sounds, it's, it's the way that it would be handled that if you omit a possibility about it, if you say no, if you say no, that this is not real, that you potentially infringe on the o security oath that you right. took. But so the no comment f across the board, everybody said the same thing and no, they do not know each other. Uh, and no, I did not say what the other person had said across the board. They said no, no comment that that's how they would handle it. And that, that if you do, of, sorry, that, go ahead. That kind of proves the point because they wouldn't want to bring down the wrath of the U S government national security sure. on top of their head. So they've never said no or yes, they've been very, that's, uh, that's correct. But yeah. but where I'm going with this is a lot of people and, and I Joe's not here, so I don't want to make it seem like I'm picking on him. Um, however, I, I just know his blog and it said they denied it. And in numerous occasions, mostly with with the Will Will Miller stuff, uh, when he said, like, no comment or, or whatever, he said, well, can you can you blame him? He would have to do that because he wants to keep it secret. 
So it seems like there's a leap when you hear a no comment that that automatically means that there's some kind of confirmation. Okay, when in well, re sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, John, please. No, 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 you're all good. Um, I've got, I, th I, I think that we really need to examine what a no comment would be. And especially I think when you talk about someone like Eric Davis, so Eric Davis, who's supposedly the author of these notes, Joe Mergia would be able to attest to this more than anyone. He's good friends with Eric Davis. He's communicated back and forth. Uh, Davis has a zero tolerance on BS. He is very outspoken. He's very quick to like, you know, kind of jump on anything that he thinks is is ridiculous or not worth his time or, you know, and uh, I think that the statements that he's made in relation to this document are so against the personality traits of Eric Davis when dealing with fabrications or lies, especially when they are literally implicating him in this situation. So, um, you know, another another really interesting aspect of this whole scenario is the Stephen Greenstreet interview uh, with Eric Davis. And this is the one that he did for the New York Post. This interview has subsequently been deleted. Uh, it has been kept alive via a transcript on Joe Mergia's blog. But there's no questioning that the, the interview happened. Plenty of people in the UFO community saw this interview. And uh, the statement that Eric Davis gives during this interview um, I, I just, it's incredibly interesting series of comments and uh, I've got it here, actually. I've got what he Please, said. Yeah. Um, so S Stephen Greenstreet was very awesome. He was very persistent with this because he asked about the Wilson documents. And first of all, uh, Eric Davis is like, I'm, I'm not saying anything about the Wilson documents. Eventually, though, after literally about three times of him saying, but you're all over this document, you've got to talk about this. Well, you know, why won't you talk about this? He said this. I can't address that at all. I won't answer any questions on the Admiral Wilson notes. They're purportedly classified information. I'm not at liberty to confirm or verify any aspect of those notes. You know, when you have security clearances, that's something you don't want to violate because the Department of Justice under the Obama administration, and it's continued under the Trump administration policies, is they will vigorously prosecute anybody with security clearances who will go out of their way to discuss any classified information that got leaked or released into the public illegally or through other means. Now, um, like John, with all due respect, how can we look at that as a no comment? That's not just a no comment. I, I mean, it. it um, I'll be honest with you. I don't see it the way that you do. What he is saying, and this is one of the rare occasions where I'm going to agree with Dr. Davis because, uh, and we can talk about this, I, I can prove that he is disseminating false information about document declassification and UFO related information to ATIP. That's documented. There's no, there's no way to dispute it. And he was very dismissive and just plainly didn't care. So my credibility scale for Dr. Davis is not as high as yours. However, with what you just said, and that quote, I don't see it that way. That's exactly, that's exactly the issue for anybody with a clearance to start talking about information like the notes, like what is purported to be true in the notes that if you say no, then, then you again are acting essentially as that spokesperson that you are commenting on something that you are not tasked to comment on. So is it, is from it not, what you just read, I agree yeah. with Dr. Davis and yeah, I think, I think he said it in black and white. But is, you know, the, the, they're very, they're blurring the lines. This it's, it's definitely linguistically created in a way that doesn't make them say that they are denying or confirming like neither of neither Hal puts off Eric Davis. None of them have ever confirmed or denied. That's the, that's kind of the point. They're sitting in this gray area, this little uh, no man's land between bureauc bureaucracy and, uh, and freedom of speech. And so they, they're saying, I can't comment on or I can't confirm or deny, but then that, that's the point. Like you're saying, if they if they say no, if they say uh, you know no, it's not real, or are you saying that simply that they if they say no, I refuse to comment on that, they're in they're in in essence implicating the fact that it's potentially sensitive information. Is that what you're saying? 
No, I, I'm saying that what I am seeing from those with security clearances are what you would legally be obligated to do, which is skirt that gray area, that you're not taking a stance. Uh, I'll use a prime example in the press uh, in the um, the press briefing card that I just released that got through FOIA. It was created by the Pentagon on how to address UFO related questions. One of which was, were your findings indicative of an extraterrestrial connection? And they didn't say yes or no. Mm. And although that's very interesting from an intelligence standpoint, the moment you say no, you're already hinting at what's in your classified arena. And so that's what I mean, that that no comment is the gray zone. And, and what I would recommend, and, and we can move on, or if you want to add anything else, please, I'm not cutting you off, uh, but we can move on from the no comment stuff. Uh, but what, what I would say is what you said, how you are framing them is exactly how those that, if, if you reach out to those with clearances outside of the UFO arena and just see how they would handle that, it, that is what you're supposed to do. You right. do not negate it. You do not confirm it. You skate in the middle and to comment e a, even a hint. And, and this was also interesting that I didn't point out. A few of them, uh, they don't know each other. Uh, I want to beat that dead horse. A few of them said the exact same phrase, you're playing with fire. That, that was the phrase that multiple clearance holders used with me trying to figure out how do people address classified, you know, potentially classified well, questions. I feel like we're getting, I don't know if we're getting stuck in a loop here, so we might have to break it, but I just, like you're saying that they, they say you neither confirm it nor you deny it. You kind of stay in this gray area. Yeah. It, it's relating to classified information and that's what they've done. They haven't confirmed or denied. They've stayed in this gray area. So it's not a script or a fiction. It's potentially classified information, right? Like they're, they're treating it like potentially classified information. True or not that that's right. That's what they would have to do. And I think my grander point is that, and I'm not putting this accusation on you, but uh, in, in what I've seen about the Wilson Davis debate is that the moment a no comment comes out, it's like, aha, see, told you, they have to say that they're, 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 they're lying because they have to. And what I'm trying to say is no, they're doing exactly what you were supposed to be. They could, they could know in their head that, that it, none of it is true, but the right answer is no comment. That, that is my overall point that none of that but, but means but anything. Why would, it be, why would they have to do that if it's just a script? If it's just a fiction, then it's not classified information. So why the dance? Uh, if it's a script, you're talking yeah. about like the, the well, I'm fun. Just saying, I'm just saying based on like your assertions that it's maybe a fictional situation. If it's, fict if it's fictional, Eric Davis didn't write it and he very well knows it. Why is he skirting a classified line of maybe I shouldn't talk about this? Why is he not going, hell no, I didn't write this. And this is about a real person, Admiral Wilson. I'm not going to be put into this situation and made to seem like I'm doing this. He would protect his reputation. What I mean, like that's, what, that's kind of what I'm saying about this is my point. Why would they skirt the edges into this little gray area that you're saying is kind of the prerequisite to discussing national security, top secret clearance holding interests and, and sensitive data? Why would, why would they skirt in that little middle ground area of neither confirming or denying, which you just said is the protocol, if it's not classified information? Because of how Dr. Davis answered it to Stephen Greenstreet and the quote that you just read. That, that that they don't want to touch it. And again, I'm not using that just to, to, to base what I'm saying on. I'm talking about, and I would recommend you do this as well, reach out to people with security clearances that are willing to talk well, and, and ask them and explore that question. I, I, I do know people with security clearances. It's just that you said specifically outside of the Outside, yeah, and that's what I mean because... But even within that, they still had security clearances and, and many of them are, are pro the Wilson documents. A recent one is... Uh, uh, Bob McGuire, uh, not Bob McGuire, uh, even though he's uh, he uh, supports uh, uh, Frank Milburn, who was a, a former British Special Forces uh, intelligence guy, and uh, and he's behind them now. So I, I think that there's a few different card holding individuals that go, yeah, this seems legit logical. And and Frank Milburn's recently come around on that. He was previously skeptical, and he said, you know what? After really looking into this, and he's been doing work with. I know that you know Brit, uh, Brit in Wonderland, mm -hmm. that uh, lovely young lady, and uh, and and he's now convinced that they are real. So there are people within the UFO circles who did hold security clearances, who are familiar with the structure 
of that kind of, uh, you know, kind of bureaucratic system of what you can and can't say. I mean, Frank Milburn knows he's under the Official Secrets Act. And trust me, I mean, you, you should know the British Official Secrets Act is kind of a few levels above what you guys have got in the States. We do not talk about anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he knows when things are kind of skirting the edges. And, you know, I've asked questions to him where he can't answer them. So I think there are people who are, you know, very knowledgeable of the inner workings of government security clearances and, and what you can and can't say who are on the side of this being real. So let's somewhat move. And, and if you want to add anything, by all means, I'm not cutting you off, but let's, let's move on from the no comment stuff and talk about the credibility of the individuals involved. I, I br spoke briefly about Dr. Davis's information that he's disseminated about a tip and he in public forums says you'll never find anything with a tip because it has to go i think his quote was 25 years before it can be reviewed all of which is provably false and my question to you is do any of these players which have turned up in a lot of different stories you talk about project serpo you know you talk about some of these crazy out there stories that have been around for many 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 years they all seem to keep turning up. Dr. Davis is one of them that has turned up in a couple of these types of, of situations. Do you feel across the board that the, the main characters involved, for, forgive the, the, the word choice there, but that the main people are credible and you don't question when they talk? I don't think necessarily I would say that I don't ever question when they talk. Um, you know, I've, I've got, I feel a, a, a healthy drip of skepticism with a lot of different people that have come out of the government structure into the UFO community in whatever way. And, you know, I try and uh, make sure I'm not being overly biased on either, on either side. But, um, you know, I think, I think when it comes to Eric Davis, uh, I didn't actually, I didn't know about the ATIP stuff. So, you know, this is where your uh, FOIA research and, and your expertise is, is shining a light on something. But I do think that Eric Davis has developed, has, has demonstrated, even if you want to question his credibility, and I'm sorry if you're listening to this, Eric, because I do appreciate, you know, what you're he's doing. A big, he's a big fan of the show. So that's okay, a given. Well, I he's appreciate listening. what you're doing, Eric. But, you know, he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's kind of been demonstrated to have a bit of an ego. And especially there's been some, mm -hmm. you know, publicly um, put out email threads uh, to bring it actually back, back to Frank Milburn in his uh, BASA Center, the Center for Strategic Studies uh, white paper that he did for this defense journalist, or, well, this kind of think tank. Uh, he had in there some uh, email exchanges between uh, Eric Davis and Jack Sarfati and a few other individuals. And, uh, you know, Eric Davis's personality sure does come across when he's when he's kind of being questioned. And uh, and Joe Mergia can attest to this, that he he's a very no BS kind of person. This is a story that is telling a bold faced lie about Eric Davis and if that's the case, that's what I, you know, hypothetically, if, if it's just a fiction, he would, he would have to say something about it. There's no way that he would like the very, you know, twisty turny quote that I just gave you from Stephen Greenstreet's interview about security restrictions and the Obama administration and how he can't talk about potentially ongoing programs. That's just not Eric. That's not Eric. That, that's not Eric. If it's, if it's about him and it's a lie and it's making him seem like he's doing something that would, ta would tarnish his reputation. I mean, you know, if, 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 if he doesn't address the fact that a document that is in very clear circulation of the public's, uh, you know, the public's sphere, I mean, within the niche of ufology, but still very much in the public sphere and accessible to the public. If there was a series of documents that were saying that he had gone to this interview with, you know, a former director of the DIA, a real person that they're really naming, he he wouldn't let that sit by. I just I don't see the I, I see a very big disconnect between his actual personality True. And, and and this and this idea because you're right. Maybe, you know, he's he's obviously done things that would make us question some of his credibility in, in terms of what he says. And then he releases some documents and he wasn't supposed to or whatever that situation is that you you were highlighting there about the ATIP situation. I think that that doesn't detract from the fact that people who know Eric Davis have said he would not put up with this. He would stamp his foot down. Let me since you brought up the ego, uh, we are 100 percent in in agreement there. Uh he strikes me as somebody who would want the attention. Do you believe that, that, I mean, have you considered 
that this group, and I don't want to just pick on him, but he absolutely, I think collectively we, we see that ego may love that attention. And by playing into that, you feed that ego. I mean, it, I'm not uh, saying that's a hundred percent it, but I'm yeah. saying you can't get away from that, that when you, when some of these guys and, and I'm broadening it here just to not pick on him, I truly believe that they want the mystique around <laughs> their character to just make it seem like they are either more important, more in the know, more read in than maybe they really are. And I hate to say it, but he strikes me as the same. And I go back to that again, that, that public display of, of information, educating public forums about document declassification and so on. That's just not true. And so what was that, right? You have a couple different things. It could just be, he didn't know, and that's fine. Totally understandable, but he didn't care about any type of rebuttal with cited sources and so on. So then is it misinformation? Is he maliciously doing that? Or is it, I want the attention and I know more than this entire forum. So I am going to tell everybody how much I know. Does he strike you as that type of a person? Well, I think it's worth considering that, of course, but I think that it's probably caused more problems. It seems to have caused more problems than it has. It's not like he's exactly keen to mention it. He, he he never mentions it unless someone brings it up and then he's kind of tries to skirt around it. And in fact, he won't answer anything now because he's in Aerospace Corporation. And Aerospace Corporation is a big deal. And, uh, and he won't talk to anyone now about anything that could be going onto an open record statement. And uh, I think that people like Hal and, and Eric... I don't know them. I've never met them personally. And uh, although you said that you feel I've spoken to Hal, I actually haven't. I haven't had uh, any uh, apologies. Had I, I thought you had, no, no, so no, no, I no, apologize. I, I don't. I, I'm just just confirming for the record. You know, I haven't had close interactions with these people. I've had a couple of email exchanges with Eric Davis, but the last one was basically saying, "Now that I'm with Aerospace Corporation, I can't answer any questions." That you know, yada yada. I think that I, I honestly think these people are probably trying to get the golden ticket. I think they want to get into the inner sanctum of these classified programs and find out as much as possible. And uh, and who knows? Potentially, maybe Eric. Day, there are people that believe that Aerospace Corporation could be one of the uh, you know uh, core secret corporations they didn't want to mention in the documents. Of course, that is pretty much just speculation. But um, it's it's a big deal aerospace defense contractor and uh, and so i think that there's no questioning eric's intelligence and capability and and obviously his portfolio i mean his portfolio must be very impressive and uh, and actually one thing that i think is quite important because you mentioned ATIP, but lou elizondo has also made statements that i think uh pushed the needle forward a little further on on two separate interviews he's been asked about the wilson documents where i mean he's been asked about it a few times but on these specific uh, interviews, his response was that he could not speak about the documents or verif verify them in any way, which is what he always says. Um, but he finished both of these interview responses by saying that Hal Putoff and Eric Davis are two of the most brilliant, most intelligent, connected and respected people he knows. Yeah, he really, he really talked them up. And he also said, uh, he either said this once or twice, but definitely once, um, he said that he believes Eric Davis is incapable of lying. Now, I know that I'm inviting you to read between the lines, uh, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, don't you think that it's appropriate for a counterintelligence officer to make these kind of statements? You know, you need to read between the lines of these people sometimes. And uh, and he's saying that he believes Eric Davis is incapable of lying. And he's saying that in response to a question about the authenticity of the Wilson documents. So, you know, what he seems to be inferring here is that Eric Davis has never confirmed these were false documents because Eric Davis is incapable of lying and uh, and to say they were fake would be to tell a lie. So he's telling us they are legitimate. Obviously, I do understand we are reading between lines and it's it's not fact. We're not the but uh, but that's not what I'm trying to present. I don't think that we're dealing entirely in facts. I think there's some very interesting data points around the kind of circumference of this whole leak. But there are also just some very interesting comments and statements and things like this where, you know, Lou Elizondo is just really not wanting to talk about it, but then he really brings up the credibility of these two people and says they're fantastic and that Eric can't lie, like, you know, he's basically incapable of lying. I just feel like they're making these statements on purpose, you know? It, it, like, 
I, I mean, sure. I don't. I don't think we'll find common ground there. I, with what Luis Elizondo said about the documents and not commenting again reinforces the security clearance potentially. You know, commenting on behalf of the U.S. government. I'll throw this out really quickly and we'll move on. But uh, with Luis Elizondo, you'll note on uh, on many of his interviews, he constantly says, "I'm not speaking on behalf of the U.S. government." There's a reason why he says stuff like that, and and I truly believe it is because you know he has to be very careful, and and the way he answered that is is right on board with uh, anybody with a clearance. But with Eric Davis, what what I'm you know. D- it, I go. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but I go back to that that misinformation, whatever you want to call it. Whether that was a malicious lie, I, I really don't know. But maybe the guy can't lie, but he could be misinformed, or he can, you know, absolutely post information that isn't true because that, that part is is provable, and that's what's kind of frustrating about how, that how angle. Can you be misinformed about something he supposedly wrote. You can't be misinformed about something that supposedly you wrote. I mean, he either didn't write it or he did write it. And so if he didn't write it, I really don't see why he'd be making the comments he's making now, which seem to be a desperate escape to try and escape acknowledging or denying they're real. I mean, like you said, he's got a bit of an ego. Maybe he's trying mm-hmm. to show votes and maybe he's trying to show off, but... I, I don't know. I just I just think that another part of his personality is the fact that he wouldn't want to be tied towards something that would affect his ability to network, his reputation. If it, if it was known that Admiral, like internally, I'm not saying publicly, if it was known internally that this was just nonsense, that it wasn't true, I just don't see why Eric Davis would make these comments. And, and also, I think that we have to fall back on Edgar Mitchell because Edgar Mitchell was a part of the briefings, the initial Pentagon briefings. And... There are other people in this that seem to confirm the fact that there was, uh, you know, a a report generated later by someone like Eric Davis. I mean, Commander Miller received a phone call from Admiral Wilson. He even acknowledged he received a phone call. And Edgar Mitchell has said on a couple of different occasions that they received a phone call. In fact, uh, you know, I've, I've got the quote here from when Edgar Mitchell was on CNN with Larry King. And he said, I eventually went to the Pentagon and asked for a meeting with the Intelligence Committee of the Joint Chief of Staff, which I got with another naval officer who had many similar experiences, and we told our story. Now, I just want to break from the quote to just mention, for those that aren't aware, that Edgar Mitchell's referring to this Pentagon meeting, this initial meeting that had been confirmed to have taken place, even by Admiral Wilson. Admiral Wilson confirmed this meeting took place, and this was the one with Edgar Mitchell, Commander Miller, Dr. Stephen Greer where they presented uh, you know, uh, lots of different information, including a National Reconnaissance Office document with listed code names and programs. So just to continue with the quote, he said, I, uh, I went with another naval officer who had many similar experiences and we told our story. And this gentleman, a vice admiral, said to us, well, I don't know about that, but I'm going to find out and called a few weeks later and said he had found the source of the black budget funding for this project and that he was going to subsequently investigate because if it was real, he should know about it. As a matter of fact, he should be in charge. Those were from him sometime later and a report much later than that, that he had found the people responsible for the cover up and the people in the know and was told, I'm sorry, you do not have a need to know here. And so goodbye. And this is also in the notes where Admiral Wilson expresses his um, aggravation towards Commander Miller for uh, actually telling Stephen Greer that this phone call took place when Admiral Wilson called up to basically after this initial briefing took place, Admiral Wilson calls up a few weeks later, tells Commander Miller, yeah, this is real. I found this organization. I think he even mentions MJ-12 and, and some other things. And uh, and then th- and then this was laid down the grapevine from Commander Miller to Edgar Mitchell and to Stephen Greer. And so Edgar Mitchell's telling us about the phone calls and a later report being generated before this document comes out back in the 90s, back on Stephen, uh, on Larry King. So it's just like there's so many different like kind of chronological areas to go with this, where it's not just we're, we're not just relying on Eric statements or Hal statements or, you know, it, we've got quite a few different people and, and, a, and a long stretch of history where this is being addressed before it even becomes public knowledge. So I, yeah. I just think that there's, that there's, a, there's a lot of converging points which seem to push it towards being legitimate, in my opinion. So you had said the 90s, just a quick uh, point of clarification. So the Edgar Mitchell thing on CNN was July 4th, 2008. Oh, my mistake. Sorry. sorry. You no, know, no, yeah. that, that's that's okay. It, it, I wasn't trying to call you out on it, but but no. it leads into the chronology of my next question, which that was July 4th, 2008. 
in 2006, going backwards, uh, Stephen Greer had talked about this as well. Uh, and I can read uh, just, just the last passage of it. Uh, essentially, everything's the same. So for time purposes, I'm not going to read you know everything here. But in 2006, Dr. Stephen Greer said uh, after Wilson was denied, uh, he says, now you can imagine being an Admiral J2, the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon and being told, we're not going to tell you. Well, he was shocked and angry. Um, going backwards again in 2001, Stephen Greer at a uh, Portland, Oregon talk in September of 2001, uh, again, skipping the whole quote, but, but finishing it up. And essentially, the head of intelligence joint staff said, I'm horrified that this is true. I have been in plenty of black projects, but when we tried to get into this one, he was told, and I quote, sir, you do not have a need to know the head of intelligence joint, st uh, joint staffs. You don't have a need to know. Uh, so there's multiple instances where, the, again, Admiral Wilson reaches out. He's denied the way that Mitchell says it. Essentially, he's like hung up on. They say goodbye. You know, they don't do it. The notes has a has a different story. the The story is he he was he denied, sure, arguably, but he flies out, meets in a vault, gets all of the information about the program. So in, in, in one breath, so to speak, there's three instances where Greer and Mitchell are saying he tried but failed. Then the notes has a completely different story where he flies out, goes to see the private contractor, gets told essentially the confirmation about alien technology and so on and so forth. And there's so many other details. Now with the chronology, the notes were written in 2002. So from 2002 to 2008 on Larry King, why wouldn't Mitchell say pr what I would consider the climax of the story, which is, yeah, Wilson was denied, but he sat there with the contractors and the attorneys and got stone cold confirmation that the, that they had extraterrestrial technology. Why in all of those instance instances is the story in the notes different than all of the rest? Well, there isn't. Uh, there's actually uh, another quote that I've got from Edgar Mitchell on this, where he uh, okay. and I, I, I've got a link um, to where this took place. I think it was actually, believe it or not, a Discovery Channel interview. It was, okay. it was found on the it was found on the uh, on the Wayback Machine. I don't know if it's actually still publicly available, but I've got okay. a link. Um, and he says, uh, I did take my story to the Pentagon, not NASA, but the Pentagon, and asked for a meeting with the Intelligence Committee of the Joint Chief of Staff and got it and told them my story. Um, I, no, I, I won't skip it, actually, because it's important that we say it. So Please, no, 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 read the whole thing. Uh, and told them my story and what I know and eventually had that confirmed by the Admiral that I spoke with that indeed what I was saying was true. In other words, there was a UFO crash. There was an alien spacecraft. This gentleman tried his damnedest to get in. And like so many others in the administration over the last 60 years since J JFK's time, was unable to. He was told, Admiral, you don't have a need to know and therefore go get lost. So it's a, it's a similar statement, but he does mention the fact that there was a UFO crash. There was an alien spacecraft. This gentleman tried his damnedest to get in. Um, so it, so it when, was, when was that Discovery Channel interview? Because I haven't me, seen that quote. Let, let me get it up on the links that I've uh, I've got with uh, with me in my emails. Hang on a second. Yeah, no um, worries. And then we can put it in the, the show notes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I just think I think that some of these statements by uh, Eddie Mitchell, I, I really don't think that they should be uh, avoided or, or kind of ignored because he does seem to be confirming peripheral evidence about what was described in the notes. Now you're right; it's none of it's verbatim. None of it's an ab, you know an admiral went to the programs and was denied access to the programs, and uh, you know, but he did fly out and meet these people. Um, Perhaps there's reasons why he decided that level of information should be remain. You know, he, he might have even been told by Eric or Hal, like, don't be too specific. Let's not talk about this too intensely. Obviously, I'm speculating here, but I'm just sure. saying that there's potentialities for there to be other reasons why he would not be extremely explicit. But he still makes the point that he went and he spoke to a vice admiral. This vice admiral went off. And I think what's interesting here is, you know, if, if we're going to, uh, take Edgar Mitchell's word for this. 
that does run contrary to Admiral Wilson's statements because Admiral Wilson says he didn't do any subsequent investigation after that initial briefing took place at the Pentagon. And Edgar Mitchell says he does. He, d he says he does multiple times. I mean, obviously, again, doesn't say Admiral Thomas R. Wilson, but he says a vice admiral who was told, well, I don't know about that. I'm going to find out, went to find out, was told he couldn't get in told them that he couldn't get in. So, so that, that's a part of it. Yeah, you and and uh, we'll add the link that you're talking to. So yeah, you can send yeah. that to me after the show and I'll update the notes and everything. Uh, but you, you bring up a great segue to my next question, which is Admiral Thomas Wilson. And uh, going back earlier in the show, you were talking about the honor and integrity of Edgar Mitchell. And for that, I have no objection uh, and 100% in agreement with you. I would also argue the same could be attributed to Admiral Thomas Wilson, uh, yeah. obviously a very distinguished military career, uh, highly regarded, you know, no controversy or anything in the sense that he left uh, dishonorably or anything like that. He says this entire thing is fiction. So my question is, we're, we're arguing Edgar Mitchell being honorable. He has to you know, essentially be telling the truth, which again, I'm not going to sit and argue that, that fact. Why are we calling Admiral Thomas Wilson a, I, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but essentially he's lying. We're calling him a liar. Um, because he has to, because he simply has to. And because he said he would, I mean, obviously I'm basing this off what's said in the notes, but he says he would do exactly this. And the, the two people that said that they would deny this have denied it. And that's Will Miller and that's uh, Admiral Wilson. Will Miller denied the letter and uh, Admiral Wilson has denied everything, even when it runs contradictory to statements. For example, we've got Oak Shannon. So, you know, when the leaks first went public, Oak Shannon was asked if he knew Admiral Wilson and he said he does know Admiral Wilson, which runs contrary to Admiral Wilson's own responses about not remembering Oak Shannon, eventually admitting they may have crossed paths, but he's crossed paths with many people in his career and he can't remember them all. Uh, you know, nevertheless, Oak Shannon has refrained from commenting further because he does not wish to embarrass or upset the Admiral, but he's never taken back his initial comments about knowing Thomas Wilson when the when the notes first went public. So I think, you know, that absolutely matters. And, and, um, and in, in fairness, though, he hasn't denied everything. He 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 concurs with the 1997 meeting. And his explanation was that Edgar Mitchell, being that esteemed American, right, what right. was he doing? And so, so he's never shied away from that. In fairness to him, no, but, but it was, uh, but he shied. At, sorry, I'm I'm sorry. I'm not meaning to. No, no, off. no. It's it's all good. Um, I think that he, yeah, he hasn't denied that meeting, but he's tried to distance any sort of ties to Oak Shannon because Oak Shannon seems to have been the intermediary between. Uh, Eric Davis and Admiral Wilson kind of meeting together because he vouched for his character. But, you know, there's actually um, quite, an <clears throat> quite an interesting thing to mention because um, there's no easily identifiable connection between Oak Shannon and Eric Davis. Uh, remember in the notes, it was Oak Shannon that essentially bridged the communication gap between uh, the Admiral and Eric. He was, he was the one that got the ball ro rolling. So why w was Eric communicating with Oak Shannon? Well, in the uh, in the Wilson notes, there is a clear mention of the APT, which is the Advanced Theoretical Physics Group, and the initials JA are mentioned in the notes as well. Doesn't take much of a stretch of the imagination to say that JA stands for John Alexander, who was one of the founding fathers of the Advanced Theoretical Physics Group. And interestingly enough, in John Alexander's book, UFOs, Mysteries, Conspiracies and Realities, he provides a list of multiple people who participated, and two of the names on that list are Eric W. Davis and Oak Shannon. And so these guys were all moving in the same circles, all interested in the UFO issue. So it's not surprising that Oak Shannon mentioned uh, was mentioned as an intermediary because he was connected with Eric Davis via the Advanced Theoretical Physics Group. So he would have had a good reason to tell Admiral Wilson that Eric was a team player and that he would keep his mouth shut and obey protocol. And, and this is what is stated in the notes, uh, that Oak Shannon vouched for uh, Eric Davis to Admiral Wilson. So it's interesting that Admiral Wilson has made relatively contrary statements to, uh, to even knowing Oak Shannon when Oak Shannon seems to be, without directly saying it, which seems to be a trend in this entire thing, is people not directly saying anything. Um, but Oak Shannon seems to basically be saying, no, he does know Admiral Wilson. Uh, so... You know, there's, there's, there's that. That's. I think that's an interesting connection because Admiral Wilson, to, uh, Eric Davis, Oak Shannon. Where did that connection come from? It came from the Advanced Theoretical Physics Group. It came from an association with this kind of core group of people. One of the other denials which you brought up was Will Miller, uh, who was there in the 1997. Uh, 
1997 meeting and the two page letter that was within these notes that was paper clipped in according to yep. the notes. Yep. Uh, I, I only laugh at that note that was, you know, paper clipped in, but anyway, uh, so Will Miller's, uh, letter is in there essentially saying for close to $200 an hour, he could help Hal put off and Eric Davis essentially unlock the secrets of the universe for, for $200 <laughs> an hour. <laughs> Now, when he's asked, from what I understand, uh, Will Miller says he remembers part of the letter, but felt that other parts were fabricated. Mm. Again, uh, distinguished military officer, yep. um, you know, you might have the same answer, but we're saying that he's lying. Uh, is that because he has to? Well, I mean, I think, I think, again, it is worth highlighting that he was explicit if this was to come out, he doesn't want any association with his name. He doesn't want any association with this. He'll deny it. Um, you know, I think the notes, because the, you're getting that from the notes just yeah, to clarify. Yeah, I'm getting okay. that from the notes, but then we also, again, I'm taking into account other things like the fact that he got a phone call from the Admiral and, and Edgar Mitchell and, and the other things that I've mentioned, but you know, in terms of the letter, cause he says it was like a cut and paste job or something like that. And I'm pretty sure Dr. Stephen Greer did say that it was very much like, uh, you know, Will's, uh, writing style, but, an interesting little tidbit in regards to the uh, Will Miller letter is the mention of Bob Beckwith and his advanced physics theories, because Bob Beckwith is a real person. Uh, he does have various theories that relate back to what was said about him in Will Miller's letter. Uh, he has a small digital footprint. My colleague who briefed Leslie Kane and, and Ralph Blumenthal was able to find trace information about this individual. And, uh, you know, again, the same individual found that the company One Mark Inc. Uh, and Joe Zuccaro, which are two mentions in the at the end of this letter, uh, were at one time listed on LinkedIn. I, I don't know. I haven't, to be fair. I haven't double checked if they're still on LinkedIn. So if it's not on there now, might as well disregard that as a nothing comment. But um, if it's still there, it's still there. And uh, that was apparently and this, you know, this individual is uh, trustworthy in their research because they were going back and forth with Leslie and Ralph, uh, filling them in on, on different areas of this for a while when when we took took down this breakdown video that I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, of the talk. So there are there are there are areas of this letter that actually, you know, make sense. And it's not like it's just been jumbled together from, you know, random things and copied and pasted. So but but when it comes to Miller denying it, uh yeah, I I, I will admit I do fall back on the document because I still think the document's real. And um he says he'd deny it. So the, the two people that said they would deny it have denied it. They followed suit. Don't you think it's, I'm just, uh, this is a kind of a humorous question, but really quick. Don't you think it's weird that the guy who's saying, Hey, hire me for $180 an hour and I'll find you the extraterrestrial connection ends his letter by saying, Hey, do you know how to contact this guy from this corporation? <laughs> like, like he's going to unlock the secrets of yeah, the universe, yeah. but yeah, yeah. I don't I know. Think that, it was a really obscure company that was dealing in like a type of pepper spray or something like that. So, uh, you know, yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's weird, but maybe, maybe he knew that, uh, you know, these guys would probably move in the same circles. Cause we're, we, you know, we're, we're dealing, uh, I mean, we're probably dealing with a time when it wasn't as informative in terms of the internet and then being able to utilize that to, to adequately sure. find these people. So I don't know. I mean, you're right. It's, uh, it's it was, one of those. It's just, I, it struck me as funny. It's, 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 a, it's a fair point though. It's a fair point because he's, he's saying that he's got all this access, but it's a different thing. It's, it's a different, you know, he's, he's saying that through his networks, through the people he's already spoken to, he's, he's able to provide them with information about, I think he said like a flag rank officer who, uh, you know, was connected to this issue. I can't remember for verbatim what he was saying, but um, but yeah, like posing that question. I always thought it was interesting that that end question, and I always wanted to know why he wanted to find out who they were or or contact them. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a weird, weird again, humorous thing. I just wanted to ask um, credibility of Stephen Greer. Uh, I don't expect you to you know slander anybody, nor am I. Uh, but again, these are just some of the key players involved in all of this. Uh, and why I bring up credibility with Stephen Greer specifically to this is many, many, many moons ago, because I've mentioned I'm old on this program before, uh, I was writing for UFO magazine with uh, when it was headed by Bill, Bill Burns. And Bill had given me a call and I was writing on and off for them. And he says, hey, can you write an article on the Disclosure Project? And as I dug in, realized that there was a rift between Edgar Mitchell 
and Dr. Stephen Greer, that Stephen Greer was essentially overstepping and, and uh, I forget the word that Dr. Mitchell used, but essentially over extending the claims. And he was very yep. upset at being named as yep. a witness. How credible is Dr. Stephen Greer uh, <laughs> in this story? I mean, it, it, you know, because you, again, you have that direct conflict between Edgar Mitchell and Dr. Stephen Greer, at least uh, many, many years ago. So that's that's why I didn't include that quote because I was always frustrated, and I, I you know, I admit um, one of one of the first things that actually got me into the UFO subject was my best friend recommending Unacknowledged, and uh, you know, I watched Unacknowledged, and I was like, wow, I was fascinated. That was one of the first things that got me interested. So you know, hats off to him for that documentary. But um, I I never included, I've never included uh, um, Edgar Mitchell's statement there because the full interview he says something along the lines of well if we are to believe the uh, individuals within government who have uh, you know hinted at this yes there are extraterrestrials yes there are et craft and that was cut to just say yes there are extraterrestrials yes and as if he's confirming it as a absolute fact and i was always frustrated because i knew because i i don't even know why he did it because you have access to the full interview you can quite clearly see that it was cut yeah. to give emphasis towards it being Edgar Mitchell's acknowledgement rather than him saying, well, if we believe these people. Um, so yeah, I look, look, we all know about Dr. Stephen Greer. We don't like, you know, really need to go over loads and loads of things about his credibility. Let's, let's be honest. He has absolutely paved the way for years. He was top dog. And I have to admit he has fallen somewhat from grace for, you know, a lot of people in, in recent years. And some of those reasons uh, are understandable. So some people seem to think that because I'm into the consciousness side and that I've had experiences that I just kind of blindly follow Greer or something, and I don't. I try and objectively look at everyone and, and decide what I want, and I pick and choose. And Stephen Greer has, has demonstrated a, a, a absolute passion, a very keen intelligence, a, a, an ability to network, a historical involvement in this issue, and a big old ego. And that big old ego is what gets him in trouble. And uh, and so yeah, you know, you're right. To, you're right to bring up his uh, his credibility issues, but I think again, it doesn't just fall on Greer. This this whole situation doesn't fall on the credibility of Greer. Doesn't even just fall on the credibility of Eric Davis. There's so many different moving parts in this that I've mentioned all already in terms of statements and and interesting scenarios and situations that I think you don't need to necessarily rely on one person, especially because they delivered information that we know to be true so we've got the national reconnaissance office document that's a real document Egg, um, admiral wilson you know was shown that document in a briefing at the pentagon that's what uh you know stephen greer has claimed but that's also what's been acknowledged by admiral wilson and it's what's also been acknowledged by Edgar Mitchell that this briefing took place. So, you know, he's telling the truth about going into this briefing and presenting this information. This is the information I presented. This NRO document was a particular interest. So in, the, in this particular scenario, I would say that, yeah, I do trust Stephen Greer to be being sincere in this because I'm not just relying on Stephen Greer to know what this situation might have been about. I, again, and I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but I really do fall a lot back onto Edgar Mitchell. And I just think that this individual would not have got himself into this situation where he was confidently talking about a scenario that seems very reminiscent of the uh, Admiral Wilson scenario if he did not believe it to be true. Um, so, yeah, you're right to bring up Stephen Greer, but I don't think that his credibility issues that people know about really reflect too much on this particular scenario other than the uh the mention of uh, of that interview where he spliced it cleverly to make it seem like edgar mitchell was confirming something when he wasn't uh you know that was that was sneaky but yeah in terms of his involvement in this particular scenario i mean you've you've, you've seen the uh, citizens disclosure conference where he's there talking about the document and he's got it and he's holding it I believe what he's saying there. And when he says that he spoke with General Patrick Hughes, I think, and, and he brought the ET doll off the shelf and said, this is all I've been given for my, uh, you know, my questions up the chain of command. I, I do believe that, that that took place, you know, and I, I don't think that particular area gives me too much doubt. But um, I understand why you asked that question for sure. Are you okay with time? I know we had a little bit of technical hiccups there. Your, your I, I am good. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's eleven thirty, but I'm happy to go for you, however long you want to go, mate. I'm okay. Happy. 
few coffees and a bit of nicotine, so I'm good. <laughs> good, good. Okay. Um, well, I won't keep you, you know, keep you all all night, but uh, but yeah. I want to definitely get to a couple other things. Yeah. And I, I, one thing that I don't feel that we've dealt with, and I wanted to ask you about, is truly the origin of these notes. The meeting between Thomas Wilson going to Las Vegas, meeting with Dr. Eric Davis. Do you have, in a nutshell, why Davis? It's just clearing my throat there. Sorry. Um, no problem. Well, uh, again, I think I'd probably go back on what I uh, what I said about Oak Shannon and the fact that they were connected through the advanced theoretical physics group. So these guys moved in the same circles. Eric Davis is a brilliant theoretical physicist with an extremely strong interest in UFOs and a background in researching it at a high level. Um, and so I think that it would make sense if he was moving in the same circles as Oak Shannon uh, for him to be, you know, it could have very easily, in my opinion, been Harold Puthoff instead that could have gone and done this, but it just happened to be Eric Davis out of the two. Perhaps Eric Davis uh, spoke to Hal about it because he was, um, you know, Hal was his boss at the time. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that it was probably just a case of, he was the most logical person. Maybe he asked Oak Shannon. I mean, the thing is, we have to then delve into speculation of like, how did the conversation go? But I think that the, the connection that is prevalent or present, sorry, the connection that's present between Oak Shannon, Eric Davis, and, uh, you know, John Alexander, Hal Putoff, Advanced Theoretical Physics Group, this seems like a pretty important reason uh, for, for it to be Eric Davis. And if, you know, if you remember in the in the in the notes, Admiral Wilson supposedly said, you know, I was very impressed with your your Air Force slides, your Lockheed slides, like all these kind of things in your portfolio. I mean, he's got a, a fantastic portfolio. That's why he's in Aerospace Corporation now doing stuff that he can't talk about. So I think that he's a pretty strong candidate. I mean, I'm sure there's other unknown scientists and physicists in the DOD infrastructure that have a, a capability, but Eric Davis at least in the public sphere, seems to be one of the most prevalent. So, it, yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me that he would want to try and get hold of Admiral Wilson, and it doesn't surprise me that Oak Shannon could have acted as the uh, kind of uh, intermediary between that happening. So, okay, so so connected to that group, no, no surprise. So let's talk about the security behind uh, what Admiral Wilson was conveying if, if this all took place. And I want to make sure we're on the same page. And if you disagree with me, please, this is why I'm asking. Would you agree that the existence, the, the, the knowledge of the existence of a highly classified program, such as what is described in the notes, that that knowledge in and of itself would be classified? Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I, uh, okay. I, know, I know what you're going to say is like, why in the hell would Admiral Wilson even acknowledge this to Eric Davis if it was classified? Well, that, okay. So then that's again, leading into this honorable thing. So he flies out to Las Vegas and now he's divulging classified information and in a car in Las Vegas to, to Dr. Eric Davis of all people. My question is, uh, he clearly doesn't have a need to know because according to the story, the Admiral didn't have a need to know. So he's out there putting highly classified information at his position out there into the ether yeah. and tells Dr. Eric Davis, why would he do that? I think he was very disturbed. And again, this is, uh, we have to just preface this by saying I'm speculating. Sure. I am speculating. I understand. Um, but I think I'm trying to kind of see a pattern out of the chaos and see where I, I, I feel it fits. And um, I think that he would have told him because taking away the side of Oak Shannon getting in contact and saying, hey, you need to talk to this guy called Eric. Why would Admiral Wilson give this information to Eric? I think he was really disturbed by what, mm -hmm. he, uh, what he encountered and he was battling with that. And I think that I think that he took a real chance with this and it backfired. I mean, that's why, in my opinion, he is saying absolutely not. This situation didn't occur. Uh, no, I refuse. Wait, this, why this did it backfire? No, I mean, I'm, why did it backfire? Because it, it became public. It became public. You know, I think that he honestly was assured by Oak Shannon that this guy was a complete straight shooter, that you would have no issues with him, and that he's very interested in talking about the UFO issue. I don't know how they, you know, if, if he was to get in contact with this guy, Oak Shannon must have really, you know, built up Eric Davis. And I think that 
potentially we could just draw this down to a weak, a, you know, subjective really, because I think it was a brilliant thing that he did if he did it, but a moment of weakness in his patriotism, allegiance, and and uh, and he thought, you know what, if I do this in a very, very clandestine manner, we do this very carefully, I talk about it in, a, in an area where I'm comfortable, I will tell you certain details, and I don't want this to go anywhere near the public sector. Uh, you know, he wasn't talking to a greasy journalist. He was talking to, you know, a, a very, very professional theoretical physicist who had an interest in this issue. I can see you smiling when I said a very professional. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I was biting my tongue at that point. Body language that much. I see it, but no, you know, I, I'm just saying. I think that, in my opinion, it, it could be that it's a, it's a situation that Admiral Wilson really really regrets he ever did he really wishes he had never ever done this and so he denies it and uh you know pot potentially maybe there were some very strong words said to him uh maybe he wasn't taken to a black site and had his nails ripped out by the you know guantanamo bay people but perhaps he was taken to the side and said you have crossed the line with this i, I don't know again it falls into speculation sure, and i and i get it this i mean this ufology you have to speculate yeah, to a you point to speculate, you know yeah so. But but I think that where I'm missing it and where I, I kind of wanted your feedback is if he didn't want this public, he was so angry, he's a J2, he's being denied access, there's alien technology out there, we have it and he can't access it and it's all hidden you know, in the private sector. Mm. What then is the motive if he doesn't want it to go public? Why tell Eric Davis? What is he trying to achieve? Well, What's Davis think, gonna do? I think that maybe he was told... Um, by someone like Oak Shannon, look, there's a guy from this group, very well funded, you know, billionaire uh, funding this group. And Nids. Um, you're talking about yeah, Nids? Yeah, Nids, yeah. So, you know, he's got this background and these are very, you know, very uh, in intelligent and highly uh, sought after people within the kind of scientific infrastructure of the DOD and things like that. You know, these are very interesting folks. And they are trying to get to the bottom of this. And I think that maybe Admiral Wilson saw this as an opportunity to pass along the little bit of attempt that he had tried in the hopes that maybe these fellas could dig down even deeper and uncover it. And he, you know, he's not going to go public with this information because that would just be far too devastating for his own career and his own reputation. But if he could maybe pass the bottle on, the message in the bottle to the next sure. person, say, hey, look, see what you can do with this. Don't ever mention my name or connection to me. I'll deny anything that I've ever said to you. This conversation never happened, but use what I'm giving you now and see what you can do. Because I tried and they get, you know, they wouldn't even let me, uh, you know, into the program or, or, you know, so I think, I think that perhaps we're dealing with a situation where this guy was like, where, where Admiral, Admiral Wilson was like, I'm, I'm going to try and see if I can push this forward through other people um, and not necessarily take it publicly because that would just be too much of an explosion. And he, he was too patriotic to bring down a system to like, you know, literally say, Are there a co there's a cover up and go on CNN. He didn't want to do that. So the, I think the best option was a fortuitous, perhaps Oak Shannon was the first person to message him. I'd imagine it was. I, don't, I, I can't imagine Admiral Wilson was reaching out to see if he could speak to someone. I'm, I'm sure that Oak Shannon made the introductions. And, uh, you know, maybe he just mulled it over a couple of nights and said, yeah, all right, I'm going to talk to him about this, see what they can do. So Just, obviously he he intended though something to be to, something to happen billionaire funded private at this point non government contractor which again I but for sake of time I won't argue that that point but I mean it, it's hard to believe that he would divulge to a a organization like this now Bass with a government contract and security clearance okay like I get on board with that but let's just l operate that that's true and that the career concern that his career would be would be you know hurt by all of this okay i'd get on board with that his career's done in the sense that he has he has now done a lot uh, you know i mean he has lived his career life if he knows something that will change this planet and deep down years ago he was willing to to give dr eric davis in in this a car um that that information that classified information i can understand why you don't want it out then but now what's he got to lose he's clearly got no consideration for a security oath he's telling classified information to people that don't have a need to know even though friends are vouching where i would again just kind of respectfully disagree that there's such a leap there that these guys would be told this information that 
that that I believe somebody of of Admiral Wilson's position, if 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 it was true to him being denied, he would never take it beyond. Or if he did, you would have like an Edward Snowden type situation where he would just go to the press and go, you know what? Let's change the world and and do this. Mm-hmm. So back to my question, because again, that's speculation on my part. Why why doesn't he just come clean at this point and just say, you know what? Yeah, it happened. Come get me. Again, I mean, it's you know, it's a good it's a good question, and uh, I I do just kind of uh, fall back on my own feelings, and you know, this is again where we're just wading into the gray area of expressing our different feelings on this issue rather than any sort of kind of uh, trail of evidence, but. I just uh, I think that he sees this as a as a big mistake, you know. I I, I think that he really regrets ever speaking to them, and uh, for whatever reason, I mean, I th- yeah, I I I would have to just fall back personally on him making a decision that he later regretted because it suddenly came out in the public, and why would he not talk about it now? <sighs> You're right. Why wouldn't he talk about it now? Like, what? Maybe one day he will. He is still alive. You know, yeah. maybe one day before this is over, Admiral Wilson will say, "You know, I was, I, w- I was not telling the truth. This is a real situation." I don't know. Maybe someone came to his house, put a gun to his family's head, and said, "If you ever say anything about this situation again, they're all going to die." I mean, obviously, we don't know. I just like I'm, I'm just saying that, that there could be a whole number of reasons after the fact. That he's decided to uh, absolutely avoid this at all costs, um, and then yeah, why would he reach out to this organization and essentially be very laissez-faire with his national security restrictions and just tell these people? I, I I do think that it was just perhaps the end of the line for him when he was contacted by Oak and made clear that people were trying to find out and they might be able to do something that they've got the backing, that they've got the resources, the knowledge, the clearances, the connections. Um, I think maybe he just had a moment where his uh, his uh, allegiance to the national security bureaucracy uh, architecture just kind of collapsed, and he had this moment of weakness. Why was he not flown away to an, a prison forever? Who knows? Maybe he really was threatened in a different way, and that's why he won't open his mouth. But again, um, this seems to be the, th- the the theme of this particular part of the conversation. Yeah, it's just speculation. It's speculation. No, and and I picked up on something you said, and I want to go back to the evidence because I want to focus on what what you want to bring out. I don't want to get you in the weeds on speculating, but I do want to ask one follow up on what you just said mm. about NIDS, where they had the clearances and the access. Now, back then, in in two thousand one, two thousand two, or two thousand two, excuse me, you know, with NIDS, granted, billionaire you know, put pumping money into this and quite a few very smart scientists and so on. But what government slash clearances are you referring to where they would have the access to do something? Well, didn't, um, didn't Eric Davis already have a background with the air force? He had his air force portfolio where he'd done like ball lightning studies and, and other, other sorts of studies or was that? Yeah. Was I mean, that- I'm sure there was a clearance level at some point. Yeah for yeah. that, but we're not talking to, cause I got those under, under FOIA, uh, yeah, yeah. which are, and I'll link those in the show notes too. So people can see he did have these contracts with the air force research lab, you know, were able to do that, uh, but not a, you know, top secret classified yeah, study. No. So obviously, you know, these guys weren't in some sort of, uh, you know, oversight position in special access programs or anything like that. Um, but I and, think and that's and that's not to step on you. That's what I mean by the question is, if Wilson truly wanted somebody to do something about it, uh, it, it goes back to that question of, OK, why the NIDS guys? Because, again, very brilliant, very smart, scientific uh, minded individuals. I have nothing bad to say. I'm trying to find the right way to word yeah. it, though, uh, but but very smart in their own right. But why wouldn't you go to a. Uh, contact at like a Lockheed or something that are into those black budget programs that have those high level clearances that are getting into uh, well that arena. I mean, I can't find the connection between the people in NIDS and NIDS itself and Bigelow at that time, connecting it to uh, the motive for Wilson to say, you know what, I'm going to chance that. Yeah. Shannon is being right. And Davis is, is going to keep his mouth shut. Um, yeah. I just don't see why he would gamble. And that's what I'm missing. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I, uh, 
I think, right, so Edgar Mitchell, when Edgar Mitchell was part of the briefing in the initial Pentagon briefing, he was already in NIDS, I'm pretty sure. He was already a member of the National Institute. The Discovery. advisory board, I believe. Yeah, yeah. The advisory board. Um, so the people, so a member of this NIDS advisory board was the uh, was part of the briefing, uh, you know, group that uh, first activated his interest and his desire to go off and find these programs and then he was apparently you know subsequently denied access so i think that he'd already probably been demonstrated that the that nids was a capable group because they were the ones that basically alongside dr stephen greer but you know all working as a team were the first ones to show him potentially evidence of this type of thing that set him off on this journey so I also fall back on the idea that I don't think he was particularly reaching out to anyone after he made his, uh, you know, phone calls to Commander Miller and uh, through it, and then Edgar Mitchell down the grapevine, down the grapevine, heard those uh, those calls. I think that was probably the extent of it for him at that time. Um, you know, according to the notes, he was threatened to be chewed out. You know, dishonorable retirement, basically, and so. I think that they approached him. They again, Oak Shannon through Eric Davis, Advanced Theoretical Physics Group, this little network. Oak Shannon, for whatever reason, maybe Eric mentioned it to him, uh, decided to reach out to Admiral Wilson, and I guess provided a compelling enough reason for Admiral Wilson to go. Well, I was chewed out for this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna talk to you about it. So I, I you know, I don't think that Admiral Wilson was particularly on the on the war path at that time to try and prove a point i think that he'd already faced that music through his investigations and through being threatened by the senior review group and uh, and then was basically prodded again by oak shannon and for whatever reason he decided to speak up about it i think the compelling reason which you had said and again that's that's what i'm missing and it sounds like maybe nobody knows that yeah compelling yeah. reason fair to say exactly because you'd need to okay. you'd need to say something pretty bloody compelling to get someone like this guy to open up i completely agree with you that it's a crazy anomaly for someone like him to actually divulge this kind of information but i think that in alignment with other parts of this conversation again that we've mentioned like uh, edgar mitchell's statements about this indeed happening and a report being generated and you know i think that there's other areas of this which just seem to confirm or lean very very heavily towards this being a real scenario so yes it's an anomaly and i guess the question is why did this anomaly occur if it occurred we don't have the answer for that we don't we none of us know so um you know that's i think that is an issue with the admiral wilson leaks is there are there are areas of this where we absolutely are having to rely on speculation but there are also areas of this where i think you are connecting dots and there's a lot of dots there are quite a few floating around when you start stringing them together something really does seem to be taking shape and um you know i mean for example i i I, I don't want to speak for you on your theory, but with the TV script or the mm -hmm. film script or anything like that, I mean, okay, I'll admit that the car park of EG and G special programs is a mysterious sounding place and would, you know, it'd make for a brilliant introductory scene in any good spy or intelligence based thriller. Um, but this is not enough to push forward the case for this being fictional, for example, not when you juxtapose this with the, um, the compounding of all these other data points. And if this was a film or, or, or TV treatment or storyboard, <clears throat> you know, you would have, uh, what's it, you'd have terminologies such as interior, exterior, close up, mid range, long shot. You'd have some level of like, you know, camera lighting, set directions, and perhaps some description of the, of the weather or the ambience. So, you, you know, you'd have notes from the script writers so that you have a visual concept of, of how sure. they want the scene to be shot. So, that, that that's always appeared a, a little bit weak to me because, uh, you know, not a single term used in this transcript relates to production terminologies at all. I mean, so, uh, you know, obviously the script, sorry, just, just real quick. No, 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 that that's fine. I wanted to bring this up because I want you to throw whatever you want at me, but I yeah, do want yeah. before we segue to that, um, uh, again, going back about uh, quite a few minutes now about your comment about evidence. And I right. don't want to just keep you in the realm of speculation. So before we get into the movie script, I want to go back to that evidence part where what, what am I missing? What do you want to bring up that supports the uh, 2002 meeting outside of eg and Like what, what evidence do you want to make sure that we have in here that I've missed? 
Well, I think I think I've gone through quite a few of the uh, of the reasons that I've given. I mean, especially in relation to comments. So you know, like the uh, the admission that seems to be a pretty direct admission, in my opinion, from uh, Hal Putzoff about uh, about Eric Davis meeting the admiral and uh, and interviewing him about Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell confirming numerous occasions that there was indeed this continuation from just this particular one briefing. Oak Shannon, uh, you know, making it quite clear that he does know Admiral Wilson. This is kind of what I'm saying is that, yes, there is no definitive fact that is the, the, the most hardcore thing to focus on. It really does seem to me that when you click a lot of these different comments over time, uh, you know, uh, events that have transpired, it really just seems to conglomerate into something that has a lot of potential legitimacy behind it. And uh, I, I just, the way that uh, Admiral Wilson's behaved, the way that Commander Miller's behaved is exactly uh, how they should behave if this is real. And, um, you know, this, again, the statement from Eric Davis about national security restrictions and ongoing programs and his own personality traits that seem to run contradictory to how he would handle this if it was fictional, uh, especially if it was fictional. Um, Eric Davis wouldn't wouldn't sit back and let this happen. So, you know, it, it's it's a lot of the things that I've already mentioned. I mean, George, George Knapp as well uh, is probably worth mentioning just because he's a journalistic powerhouse in ufology, very well respected and connected. And, uh, you know, he, he he's very good friends with the folks over at NIDS, especially Robert Bigelow. So I think it's relevant to mention the fact that George Knapp has also said on record that the notes are real and that the meeting happened. Um, and, uh, and, and also, you know, you're aware of the recent work done by uh, the researcher named Britt. You know, she mm -hmm. has done some very interesting digging and uncovered... <clears throat> Uh, you know, government documentation uh, that strengthens the existence of uh, gaps in oversight as it relates to special sure. access programs, mm -hmm. SAP categories. And, and so, you know, I just think that it's more about the coalescing of different data points and starting to string them together. And I, I, I really do see a picture taking place here. And yes, there are gaps and yes, there are anomalies in this in this issue. But I really don't think that the 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 anomalies outweigh the signifiers of something very strange going on here uh, you know whether or not all of it is honest and and true maybe not but i am pretty pretty certain that the documents are real that eric davis met with the admiral and uh you know there are off record comments which is the most frustrating thing that i've ever you know i before i came into this subject i was never dealing with people talking about things off record and on record. I've had to learn very quickly to be able to understand how to talk about things online and on a public forum, as I'm sure you you have experience in the same of having to do a little dance sometimes when someone's sure. saying something to you in the background. Um, so, you know, there are off record comments that seem to very much strengthen the legitimacy. So, you know, I, 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 I understand that that comes from the privilege of being in connection with certain people and getting to hear things that most people don't get to hear. So for uh, anyone listening, it's just like, well, that's great. You know, you get to hear something special and no one else does. Well, you know, uh, you know, boohoo for you. Like it's, it, it really does suck. I, I understand that, but those things, the public stuff, I just think that there's something here. Like I said, at the right at the beginning of this, I'm not trying to sell the documents as the entire situation from start to finish is absolutely on point and everything in it is real. But it really does seem to me like this is something that should be kept within the ufology circle, thrown around, examined over time, maybe trying to develop upon it. Like, you know, the, the mention of Brit is an important thing because before Brit turned up and kind of found a few extra little tidbits that seem to point towards the possibility of, uh, you know, like an obfuscation of oversight in these programs, this whole situation was static for a minute. So it's kind of just edged a little bit further forward, in my opinion, with the fact that we've got documentation that confirms that, hey, you know, oversight oversight issues can exist, especially in special access programs where things get very murky. So, uh, you know, I think that with time, this genuinely might be developed upon to a very, very clear point. And, uh, and I think that, you know, the fact that people like Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal were you know, willing to talk about this on and off record. Uh, I just think that there's a lot of people that find this to be very interesting and worthy of, uh, you know, scrutiny. So 
So, so yeah. on with Ralph and, and Leslie, and before we move to the, the, you know, the wild and crazy movie script, uh, if they're willing to look at it and despite gaps and so on, I mean, I've seen re- UFO stories that have a heck of a lot of gaps get reported. Yeah. Why haven't we seen this in the New York times? Why haven't we seen a mainstream media outlet? Look at this and come up with even just a question mark. The, the, the shout out that I want to give Billy Cox, uh, who has done quite a bit over the years. I'm not sure if you like his angle or not, but regardless, my shout out is he digs and he's trying to get these on the record comments. And from what I understood with the online rumor mill was that the New York Times was doing this crash retrieval Wilson Davis story notes expose. And we were going to like, that was it. This is going to be you know, a disclosure because New York times is going to put their masthead on it. And we all know that that just fell flat. Yeah. So what is your opinion on that? I mean, if the evidence is strong, why don't, and it may not even be the New York times, but why not someone, some outlet take the gamble and go, you know what? There is enough to at least say maybe. So um, <laughs> this is going back to what I was saying before about how I've had to have a steep learning curve in uh, knowing what I can and can't say on on record. But um, uh, I I know I know that that this was something that they wanted to include in the New York Times, and it wasn't necessarily it was it wasn't necessarily their own actions that caused that to potentially not be in the New York Times. So, I mean, there, there's there's a bit more of a backstory to that. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I've got to be a bit cautious with that. But. I understand. I, and, and they probably entrust, and that's fine. Where I'm going with this is if this is solid and the New York Times powers that be want to say, yeah, you yeah. can't, no way, which I would doubt because they've yeah. taken gambles. They did the A-tip story, kudos to them, mm-hmm. uh, which coincided with the Politico story, but they broke that. They're breaking those types of boundaries. Yes. I, th- I think, I think one of the issues, uh, sorry to cut you off, but no, no, um, that's okay. Uh, I think one of the issues, and this is something that I'm sure you will understand, uh, is that they weren't able to get people to go on record about confirming the legitimacy of these documents. So, um, I, I think that they tried, and this is just kind of informed speculation on my side, but I think that they tried their best to model this within any sort of potential articles as a, as an addition to other conversations they were maybe having. I mean, you've got to remember that Eric Davis was quoted by the New York Times to say that there have been off-world retrievals and, you know, off-world vehicle uh, retrievals. Uh, he he was quite brazen about that in the New York Times. And, um, and uh, I, I want to say he said not from this earth or not of this earth. There was the quote. And, and this is very close to what was said in the Wilson documents when it said, uh, you know, that these craft were uh, off world, not made by human hands, not made by so, human, not made yeah, by man, not, not by human by hands. That's yeah, the exact not, quote. Not of this earth. Or, and so and so, you know, you've got a quite similar wording structure with the quotes that they were given by Eric Davis. But I, I think that it probably did come down to, um, unfortunately, the New York Times looking at it as a situation that didn't have enough behind it. So that's fair enough to acknowledge that. I do acknowledge that simply because they have a kind of strict prerequisite for getting something into the New York Times, which involves, I think they said when they were on uh, their interview with me that you usually need at least two corroborating sources that are willing to go out and put their name on the line uh, for for something like this to take place, and so they they didn't reach that with with the uh, with the Admiral Wilson scenario, and so I think that if there was any sort of plan to include that, it was uh, it was probably taken out because of the fact that they can't directly unequivocally confirm it to be accurate, uh, which is a shame because I think that you should still be able to put out an opinion piece. I still think that this should this could very easily. Uh, and you know, I, in fact, I spoke with Stephen Greenstreet not that long ago, and uh, and when we were having a back and forth, he was like, you know, I'm I'm probably going to try and pitch this up to the New York Post again through this way of looking at it that you've just explained. Because I said, you know, it doesn't have to be an opinion; it doesn't have to be f- like absolute fact. It can still be an opinion piece. It could still be written in a way that allows for people to finish that and go. 
oh, maybe that could be true or maybe it's not. I'm, I get people thinking about it. You don't have to have a really biased perspective of like, you know, there's, there's no way this can be denied because that's not true. There are ways in which this can be questioned. But I think there's enough there for people to be interested and enough there for people to be, uh, you know, intrigued as to whether or not this could happen. And it could, it, it could spark the, the, the wheel of momentum and maybe you'd get more people from the intelligence infrastructure coming out and putting something towards this. So I think that it, it, it represents a, a, a capability to be in the mainstream media. I just think that they were dealing, in, well, in fact, I know they were dealing with some very strenuous editorial processes going through the New York Times superstructure. Sure. Um, you know, so I think that there's a lot of red tape involved in that scenario. No, I, and, and, and like yeah. I said, I, I think that even if it wasn't the New York Times, you know, Leslie Kane as a freelancer, and I believe Ralph, although yes. worked, for, and yeah. I could be wrong, but worked for them at one point is now considered a freelancer and so on. So as a freelancer, they can just say, all right, you guys want to do your stupid red tape thing. Psh, see ya and yeah. go somewhere else if it was yeah. strong enough. But maybe we'll see that. Um, before I move on, uh, evidence wise, just to close that, I want to make sure that I am not cutting you off or anything like that. Is there anything else that you want to make sure that you get in before we move on? No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go where you want to take this now. You know, we, we've almost been going for two hours now. This is crazy. I think this is- I, You uh, know, I, I know. We had a little bit of the technical hiccup, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah, about an hour, hour 45 or so. Don't worry. I'm, I'm happy to keep going. I'm happy. You're okay for another 15 minutes or so? Well, yeah, yeah. No Perfect. Problem. No problem awesome. So then, so now we'll go to the movie script, which you had brought up. And just to kind of preface it for the audience who isn't aware, I've got a video. I'll link it into the show notes where I posed a theory and I want to stress the word theory. I was not saying that I believed wholeheartedly. These were the notes. It was a possible explanation also in the title of the thing uh, of the video. I think that that got misconstrued, not by Jay or placing the accusation, but in the Twitter verse, you know, that John thinks it's a movie script. My intention was to show a, in my opinion, very plausible al alternate explanation and what I found fascinating was number one, the reaction to it, right? I mean, like <laughs> there was some, some very choice words from people, but number two, it probably was, me, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll say that again. I said probably from me as well. I'm sorry for any oh, previous, previous Twitter comments. I threw your way, John. No, I, I, and I'm not worried about it. Look, you use Twitter. You have to have a thick skin and look, we've water under the bridge. No, no problem. Uh, but th that said, the intent was to show, again, that plausitive alternative, a story based on real characters with real names and real events using as a launching point to create a narrative. And you noted it, uh, that, that it, it doesn't look like a script. There's no elements in this and that. But if you watch the video, what I do is explain that, yes, it's a very amateurish attempt which in television, I've produced quite a bit for networks over here, History Channel, Discovery. And in those processes, when you're, a, uh, I worked my way up to a supervising producer. So when you're in that position, a lot of times you'll have people that will come to you and say, hey, do you mind looking at this and, and taking a look at it, see where I go wrong? Those that want to move up and write, and they take stabs at scripts. Those are what I liken this to somebody who wants to do it or maybe wants to take a stab at it but hasn't necessarily gone through you know the, the the formal training now where i look at this and again pose pose the theory is that you have dialogue you have scene settings which are script elements so i know you can say that uh or admit to that part uh but also the interjections which i thought were silly you know like thomas wilson going let me finish with an exclamation point those types of quirky things now, is Dr. Davis, you know, quirky and that's how he makes notes? Sure, I could be open to that. Uh, or this was just a, a dialogue. But again, the intent was to show what could be a plausible explanation. The people that came after me about it just said it was stupid, but they never really countered with anything other than, well, that can't be true. And it's like, you don't want to, not you. But the, the, those that are advocating that these notes are real, they don't want to have the burden of proof, meaning there's a lot of conjecture, which you've admitted. You have to speculate a little bit. You got to fill in the gaps and so on. But with an alternate theory, dismiss it outright. No way. They're, that's not true. I know for a fact, no way. And they, they, they 
they go back to it being real. And again, I'm not, I'm not accusing you of that unless you want to say that that's how you feel, which is fine. Uh, but, uh, but that's what I gathered from that was that can't be true because I don't want to believe it. Ergo, it's not true, but this is true, but we have to speculate, fill in the gaps and maybe twist some words here and there. And so that is the conclusion that they have come to. And okay. so that's really kind of the foundation that I wanted to make sure everybody who hasn't seen those videos know that that's where I was coming from. So right. I'll pass it to you. So, I mean, yeah, so speculating about, uh, you know, the ifs and whats and maybes of the documents, I mean, <laughs> There's there's no there's no direct real evidence of this being a script as you've acknowledged in terms of terminologies. Um, so you're you're having to speculate that it's a very amateur script because you right. know I could essentially write down all of the dialogue between you and I and then just say that's a script, uh, you know, and uh, for, for a movie or something, and uh, and that's basically what you've got. Yes, there's very strange ways in which it's worded, but Eric Davis is a bit of a weird like savant who seems to remember so much detail so he was and it seems like based on what admiral wilson was saying to him in the description in in the notes that he was aware that he was taking notes that he was jotting down things because he says what are you going to do with all this information so i think that um he was probably taking very quick notes in real time and uh, fleshed it out maybe after the fact but uh, i think that it's it's more it's more just likely a testament to his uh, his intellect um that there's this very strange level of detail but the um the script the script writing thing gets me because i feel like you have to juxtapose the amateur script writing that has no production terminologies in it whatsoever with the exquisite knowledge and detail that is presented in the Admiral Wilson documents relating to program terminologies, to, you know, special access program, the chairman of the, you know, office of uh, Alstat. There's a lot of terminology, the ATP, the advanced theoretical physics group. Um, but what in there, not to step on you, what in there is new that wasn't publicly available? No, you know, absolutely. But definitely not widely publicly available so i'm just wondering who wrote this script for what for what reason why was it never adapted into anything why have we never heard about a company that was looking to do this there's there's i'm just saying that ba based on face value of it, of calling it a script there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of evidence for it being a script other than the fact that it's you know well well worded and, and kind of like beefed out and and seems almost a little too uh, you know, uh, data intends to even be a, a, a conversation, but we are dealing with someone who, like, uh, you know, uh, Lou Elizondo said, is a very brilliant mind, and he does have an extremely keen uh, memory. Um, but the thing is, as well, in order to, um, in order for this to be a fictional script, we do have to be calling Eric Davis or Hal Putoff uh, liars, uh, you know, individuals who've dedicated their careers towards finding out as much as they can about the UFO issue. Um, I, I just don't know why would they decide to write a fictional script or to, if it was, if it was who said given, they wrote it, well, that was about to say, if, if it was given to them, circulate it amongst the core members of a highly professional UFO research group, and then allow Edgar Mitchell to go live on CNN with Larry King to talk about it. Um, and then give their strange comments. And then, you know, there's been other statements. Um, you know, I just, I just, it like there's, there doesn't seem to be enough for for me to say yeah there's there's definitely something here that says that it could be a production storyboard even a sure. even a really basic one even a really basic one so i i know you saw cuz you commented on it uh you had a uh, an animated gif response where there was somebody who worked in television and said to them it it looked like a movie script or something like that uh there's been quite a few comments on the video as well and in both ways people attack i'm not saying that oh my audience agrees with me no i'm not saying that uh what i'm saying though is that there are people that support that theory in the sense that they have that background they can they can see that connection but here's my overall point is that again it's just a, a possibility i'm not betting my house on this but in order for the script theory to to really be made uh, to really be solidified you need to essentially speculate right you need to fill in the gaps right you need to to, to fill in the holes because not everything there is to prove that this is a script and you need to take the support structure from other people that are out there that may know and, and feel that this is a script, that they come along board with it. And here's my point, is that what's different with that 
John, sorry, mate. I, just, I, just, I just lost my Wi-Fi connection. That's so okay. I just lost about 10, 15 seconds. Sure, no talking. problem. I can go back. <laughs> Which, where, what's the last you... Uh, uh, I honestly can't remember because I was just frantically trying to get my Wi-Fi to come back. Oh, that, on, so that's said, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just take back your so, frame. So, forward. yeah, yeah. Then I'll start the, the thought over and hopefully make it more concise. But so in order for the script theory, because uh, again, I'm not betting my house on this to make sense. Or excuse me, <clears throat> let me start over and I'll edit that stumble yeah, out. Uh, no, I won't. I won't edit this so everybody <laughs> can see my stumbles. I don't want to cut anything out. Uh, so in order for the script theory to make sense, I'm not betting my house on this, that this is the absolute truth. But in order for that to make sense, you need to fill in the gaps, right? You need to speculate a little bit uh, because the evidence is not there. I fully admit that, that this is 100% a movie script, just a theory. But you need to speculate. You need to fill in the gaps. There are enough people that have commented that have, according to them, a uh, entertainment background where they can see the possibility. So I have a support structure. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying my entire audience feels that way. In fact, a lot of people disagree. But I have that support structure from people that know about it that say, you know what, uh, that, that's very well, that could very well be true. So I have all of that. And my question to you is, what is different? than what we've talked about for the last hour 45 from what I feel is kind of the same way for advocating for the documents. You have gaps, you have to speculate a little bit, you got to read in between the lines a little bit, you got to um, essentially, uh, forgive the, the phrasing, but make up the middle to get to the end where these things are real. And that's what I was so fascinated by that people would dismiss the theory and call me every name in the book and say it was stupid but they never really explained why they just said, no, that can't be true. So what is the difference? Well, I think that, um, cause I, I you know, I've, I haven't worked in the industry, but I did a degree in TV and film production. So I've got a background in, in like reading scripts or treatments or storyboards or anything like that. Um, if, if I was given the notes and I had no background in ufology and I didn't know about, uh, these people and I read it, I'd say, well, yeah, that, that looks like it's a story. Like, you know, this looks like it could be a story, but I think that, that you know you did say and you're right that there's speculation on both sides i feel like there's more speculation on the script side because there's no evidence for it being a script like there's no direct evidence in the actual writing of it being used for a production or any intention of it being used for a production but when you look at the other side of this there seems to be and again like i can't go through everything that i've gone over but the statements the 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 connections to things in the in the in the uh, in the notes like the ATP being mentioned. There's a lot of stuff in here that would suggest a, a a very a very detailed knowledge of not only UFOlogy, but the inner workings of the governmental structure of special access programs, who coordinates them, who looks at the oversight. And uh, and again, you do have these statements from people like Edgar Mitchell and uh, the strange statements from Hal Puthoff and Eric Davis. So I think that there's I, I I think there's a lot more supporting the idea that this is potentially legitimate than there is for supporting, uh, you know, the script. If there was one bracket ext close bracket in that, I would be very suspicious. You know, saying that it was some sort of a particular shot or some sort of particular scene, open scene, e g and g. You know, the admiral pulls up the car, you know, the, the, all of that. But, if, but, but three quarters of what you just said is in there. It just didn't have EXT for exterior in the script. And I think that that, that again, leans into the amateurish approach uh, that, that I think somebody could yeah. take. So it's speculation to just say, well, we didn't see EXT, so we have to R right, right. do but away like with it. Like I said, I am honestly just going to have to fall back on all of the things that I've already listed in this conversation and say that I feel like there's more of those things than there are for being on the side of a script. Like if there was a lot of different signifiers of this being some sort of dramatized situation, uh, you know, then I would I would agree. But the thing is, there's dialogue in these notes that's been confirmed by people outside of just the existence of these notes. Again, Edgar Mitchell confirming that there was some sort of investigatory journal, a journey done by a vice admiral who was denied access and other people who have also said similar things. So you've got, I, I feel like you've got more on the side of this being a real situation. I'm, I'm not seeing, like I, I guess you're not seeing on my, on my perspective on some of this, I'm not seeing enough evidence for me to be satisfied 
with it being a production script. Um, I'm, I'm happy to acknowledge that there could be issues in this uh, story. Maybe Admiral Wilson was told lies. Maybe he lied to Eric Davis. Um, so we don't know if everything is completely, uh, you know, true. Uh, but I, I, I personally am not seeing the evidence for a TV script outside of some dramatized styles of writing. And uh, and Eric Davis is a is an interesting guy and uh, has a has a a, a, a pendant for, for drama. <laughs> so he's he's quite a dramatic character anyway. So I could imagine him writing it in this way. But um. Yeah, when it comes to kind of like the war of speculations, I kind of feel like there's more speculation for it to be incorporated into a, a, a treatment script storyboard than there is for this to be a, a potentially real scenario. I I find it interesting that <laughs> one of the key players and advocates for the notes who's involved with it is heavily involved with making entertainment scripted programs who's that Stephen Greer right yeah, and but... he's got now I will not say that I think that he made it but what I will say is that's in the same arena from those who are advocating that there's something real and it just so happens that there's this I would say dark and shady past that Edgar Mitchell himself was very upset that Stephen Greer was overreaching with the claims that he was making and so that's why, in my opinion, will I sit here and go, I think Stephen Greer wrote this. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying you can't say he didn't either, because the past is there with the honorable American that you speak very highly, highly of, and so do I, was pretty upset at Dr. Stephen Greer for saying things that weren't true. And when I, you know, when I asked Dr. Greer, are the notes real? And the quote uh, I'm paraphrasing, he said, yeah, pretty much across the board and that he would want to go line by line with me. And I mean, we'll see if that ever happens, but um, there's just something weird here. And I think that there's a discounting of those types of things for um, substituting the, the advocating that this is all real. And, yeah. and that going back to the, the fictional script idea was again, not, not trying to say like, look, this is definitely a script, but rather there's the same, in my opinion, and I know you'll disagree, but in my opinion, the same amount of evidence per se mm -hmm. with a very comparable amount of speculation and gap filling to either say this is a fictionalized account or that it's real. And I think that that's what we're missing in this entire conversation. And I appreciate you showing up here to have this conversation. So I'm not directing this at you, but a lot of people will discount any other theory simply because they believe that it's real. And you've acknowledged that a lot of it falls back on off the record and anonymously sourced statements. And that to me makes this an incredibly difficult situation to, to buy into. Okay, um, so let me ask. Let me ask you: um, mm -hmm. If Eric Davis didn't write these notes, uh, and let's just say for the sake of argument, Stephen Greer wrote these notes and uh, and has circulated them under false pretenses, why has Eric Davis not said that this is just a bunch of BS? Uh, you, you. That's a great question, and I don't know. Uh, but I do fall back on what you led off with with his with the ego. And, and I agree with you. And, yeah. and does he want that attention? Does he care if his name is involved in a fictionalized whatever? Because look, there is an army of people that support these documents, that, that feel that they are real, and that the main character of the story, the, the two main characters, includes Dr. Eric Davis. So I would absolutely put up the argument that based on what we see publicly from him, from that egotistical standpoint, that he would want that. He wants that mystique. Okay. And, and, and that group of people, I know I said it probably an hour and a half ago, uh, but I'll repeat it here, is that that group of people, I think, likes the mystique. I think they like the aura around them of mystery and okay. intrigue and that they are more in the know than all of us. And one thing I'll say about Dr. Hal Putoff, who I've spoken with uh, 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 directly, and I give him credit because he's one of the very few that writes me back, and I know he's not a fan of mine, uh, but he will absolutely uh, respond for the most part 
when I reach out to him and I, and I give him credit for that. But if the rumors are true that he believes in this MJ 12 particular document, I don't want to spiral off into that. But my whole point is, is that if that really, if that rumor is true, cause I couldn't get him to confirm that that was the document. If that is true, then there's a, another layer here of an issue that if he's privately telling people that that MJ 12 document is real, I believe definitively that that is a hoax. And this is the SNIE, the National Intelligence Estimate document. Again, I, I, I don't want to spiral off into that. But my whole point is, is if all of that is true, he may want that, that mystique as well, that he okay. knows certain things about UFO crash retrievals and alien bodies that nobody else knows. So, uh, so would you, would you say then that either Eric or Hal lied to Edgar Mitchell? Why was it? Why was Edgar Mitchell talking about uh, an associate of his interviewing an admiral in Las Vegas or the fact that the admiral was denied and got a report later than the calls that confirmed it? I mean, you know, he was obviously very convinced that this was real. So someone lied to Edgar Mitchell in, just in your theory of sure this was the way it went down. And Eric Davis was actually aware that this was fake, but wanted to boost his own ego. He uh, he he risked he risked the credibility of the NIDS infrastructure and potential uh, you know reputations with people that were his very close colleagues by lying to them and allowing them to talk about something like this on uh, on live television. So that goes back to the Discovery Channel. I think you said Discovery quote right that we talked about because I wrote it down and I. That was actually a different quote. I'm, I, I have actually got links for these quotes in an email, so I'm happy to send them to Please. you. You can put them in the description. Box. I will put them all in so everybody knows um, what we're talking about. To, to, yeah. to, to answer your question, though, what was Edgar Mitchell lied to? I mean, that's a powerful accusation to make, and I don't want to sit here and say that they sat there and totally misled uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell. But what I would be open to is that these notes somehow, because again, that context is missing which is why one of my first questions to you is what was the context of why these notes were in, you know, his possession that the context that plays a huge role in, in how to answer your question. And I can't because nobody can answer that question for me on why yeah. he had them. Why he but, had them? Because he was with NIDS. I'm talking about the, okay. But, but again, I mean, I think, uh, and this is challenging my memory because it was a couple hours ago now. Uh, but I had asked about the actual context of what the, uh, like you said it and correct me if I'm wrong, that nobody can say that either Davis handed these to Edgar Mitchell and said, I sat down in a car with Thomas Wilson. No, no but like the, the, the fact that Edgar Mitchell talks about it with such confidence, at least hinting towards the sure. situation that seems to be this issue. Uh, the fact that he talks about it with such confidence and he has this background in the NIDS advisory board connected to Edgar Mitchell and, uh, um, uh, you know, Will, uh, not Edgar Mitchell, uh, Eric Davis, Hal puts off Will Miller. Um, I think that that is a pretty good reason why he would be in, have access to this kind of information that would be circulated through NIDS. And I think it was, uh, let me just make sure I've got my, uh, my facts right. But um, Commander Miller told uh, yeah, Commander, uh, Commander Miller told Stephen Greer, and I believe he also told Edgar Mitchell about the Admiral's phone calls. And then in the notes, because again, we're having to use the notes, but we're referring back to a real interview that took place, which is the Larry King interview, where he says they had calls in a report. Um, if, you're, if you're kind of comparing that with what's said in the notes, Eric Davis confirms that it was Edgar Mitchell that told him about the phone calls from Miller, you know, th this whole kind of phone call trajectory. So there's there's things outside of the documents that seem to confirm what's written in the documents about the way in which this kind of traveled down the grapevine of this group. And again, if it was gonna be circulated through NIDS because Eric Davis and Hal Putoff were prominent members, then the guy that was on the advisory board who also did the initial briefing for Admiral Wilson, Edgar Mitchell, of course he's going to be tied into that and given the documents. They came they, they came from his estate. They came from his estate in a cache of files all to do about the UFO issue. Um, so I, I think that it's very, uh, it's, it's, 
again, I know I know we're having to kind of move into speculation, but I feel like it's kind of like informed speculation where you've got a good idea as to why a man like Edgar Mitchell would have these documents in his possession. He was moving in the same circles as the people that supposedly got this information into their group. And he was also the guy alongside Greer and Miller who was at the initial briefing of the Pentagon. So he's in a perfect position to be let, you know, read in on that by his sure. colleagues. So this this next question, and and you may believe this aspect to the story or discount it. I've never seen it dis discounted or discredited, and I don't mean this this question to be disrespectful to the late Dr. Edgar Mitchell, but I do have to ask because he has talked with assertion about other things, specifically being uh, remote healed by a healer in Canada of kidney cancer. Do you believe that to be true? John, I went into my back garden, got into a calm state of mind, a meditative state of mind, very coherently planned my thought process of what I wanted to happen and be exposed to and had orange orbs of light flow over the house that I'm li currently living in. Um, and people can call BS on that as much as they want. I really don't care because that happened to me. And that's one of the most important reasons why I am still invested in this subject because of the actionability of consciousness in a non-local format, the exchange of quantum information between separate systems in space and time via the medium of consciousness. And I think that absolutely I am willing to believe or trust in the fact that he uh, had these kind of experiences because I'm not yet willing to discount the actionability of consciousness and, and its way to interact with other bodies. And there are people who have, you know, who claim to be able to speak with spirits or to be able to do this, that, and the other. The, the entire fi field is filled with charlatans. And then there's real people, you know, there are real people. I mean, you know, a, a little example of this is my mother went to a medium uh, once and, you know, the information that was given to her and it, this, you know, what, I'll, I'll always trust a medium that lives on just a random estate, like in a rundown house, who's not on a TV show, who just lets people come for free and do a reading. That's the kind of medium I trust. And, uh, and she, she managed to produce some uh, fascinating results about my mom's personal life that just blew her away. So I think that, when we're talking about like, should we consider Edgar Mitchell credible because he believes in these kind of things? Yeah, I think that absolutely, because this is an unknown physics that is still being addressed. In fact, it was, you know, addressed in the ATIP slide nine, uh, you know, comments about how these things seem to be able to affect cognitive human interface and all sorts yeah. of strange ideas around consciousness. And, uh, and that what was once uh, called the phenomenon or what was once paranormal is now quantum physics. And so, I think that yeah, that doesn't that doesn't strike me as a particularly big red flag. Just because, from my own perspective, and I'm sure you have some, you know, uh, very intelligent but materially, uh, you know, aligned individuals within your demographic who would say no, this is just woo woo silliness. But I have to draw back on my own subjective, mm -hmm. totally subjective evidence. That's my own personal evidence that there is something about the perturbing of the mind, the perturbing of consciousness. And, uh, and its potential to act in an, in an expanded state that doesn't just interact with this, uh, you know, this, this human body. So yeah, my, my perspective on that, because consciousness is kind of my jam is that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is, this is not necessarily a red flag for me. Yeah. And, and I think uh, just to clarify the question, cause I grew up in a very, my mom was very metaphysical growing up. And so I've been, been a around that kind of stuff and that's a totally different show in itself. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> I'm not turned off by that idea, but I think the root of why I'm asking it essentially leads into uh, your question of, you know, was he lied to? And and that's the, that's the thing. We don't know if they even had a conversation with him. We don't know the true and exact nature. And to your admission, you have to kind of fill in those gaps. And, uh, you know, was he lied to or did he just believe a little bit more easily than he should. I, the, the one quote that I did write down that I want to see, uh, you said that he was, uh, he expanded on the story, the quotes that I had pulled to read and all the ones that I saw stopped at a certain point. So again, it was like the notes had all these other details, but all of the interviews yeah, by Edgar yeah, Mitchell, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, kind of stopped there. But if you have something great, I'd, I'd love to, to see it. Yeah, we'll but I, sure. I think that, that going back to the question you asked me, it's so hard to answer because we have to speculate that he was even told anything that we don't know the true 
con- and I know that we can assume certain things, but the true context of why he had it. And did Dr. Davis give it to him and say, look, this is what I had. Uh, this is what I experienced. This is what I saw. This is what I heard. I, I don't know that. Uh, and until somebody well, comes along, we can't really um, say for sure. Well, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I mean, what would your personal opinion be on why he said, we got a call a few weeks later and a report much later than that, that confirmed that this indeed like happened. I mean, what, what, what do you think he was referring to in regards to a report other than this? What I, what I could, that's a great question. What I could uh, take away and, and kind of believe from that is that Admiral Wilson stepped on something that maybe was not for whatever reason in his need to know and that he was denied. I could buy that. It would, I would still put up an argument, but I could buy that much of it. Um, but I, I, I kind of lost my train of thought. It, what was the way you asked the question here? Because I started to. Yeah, no, that's fine. I was just saying um, in relation to Edgar Mitchell on CNN saying that there was a call and then a report. Oh, there's the call and the report. I'm sorry. I kind of went off on a yeah. different way. Okay. Uh, so that that's the part that I could, uh, you know, hop onto. And so for him to get a call could absolutely be supported where Thomas Wilson says, look, man, I, I got into some, we'll call it department of energy, you know, type program. I'm, I'm just saying that because that I could buy that he tried to access something that was a little bit out of his need to know being a J2 with the DOD, but, you know, over there with DOE, which has a whole nother l- level of, of secrecy, they go, look, I mean, this isn't a DOD jurisdiction, so to speak. Uh, so you're not allowed. I could buy that. And so the phone call and the report, I didn't take him saying report as a written report, just like it was a report like, yeah, I called, uh, I got denied access. Let me get back to you. And then he reported back and and solidified. Yeah, I tried and I couldn't. I think so again, word- that's Sorry, I just said the wording of it because he said like he said we received phone calls and then a report much later than that. So it seems like there's a differential between a phone call and what he's claiming to be a report. I mean, sure. Are you claiming that that's the notes? I I think it's probably likely that that's the notes. I mean, I can't think of anything else. I mean, obviously, this is the only thing we have within the public sphere. uh, These notes to kind of go by. But if I was going to, if I'd been exposed to phone calls and then a report by Eric Davis, like a transcript by Eric Davis like this, I would probably consider that a report, you know, but that's more than a four year gap. So, so 1997, they meet in the Pentagon with Wilson Greer, Will Miller, and so on. Right. Uh, He goes out, they, they try and, or he, uh, Wilson goes out, he tries to gain access, gets denied. If the report is that's, uh, yeah, 2002. So that's that's a that's a 5-year gap. That's more than 5 years. So if it was I think April of 97 is when the rumor was, I think April 9th or something somebody quoted was quoted saying, I don't know. We'll just call it 1997. The notes were not written until 2002. So you're talking about again that 5-year gap. So yeah. Yeah. All right, no that I'll 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 acknowledge that that, that could be uh potential I'm I'm trying to fit. Yeah. Um, that's definitely, yeah, that's definitely the right chronology, isn't it? That, uh, he made those statements prior to the, prior to the notes being made. Co- correct. I mean, assuming that the meeting was, you know, 2002 as, as written, uh, written. and there's a four year gap between Stephen Greer's retelling of the story, but that also ends with, you know, he tried and, and, stopped access you know he he couldn't get uh couldn't get access i think that then in that case yeah the report the report it could be considered to be you know questionable since it seems like it might require time travel but um (laughs) (laughs) which could happen hey i'm I'm all for it well i've heard things but um no i think i think that what he's still outlining in there which which again he does outline the fact that there was a subsequent investigatory journey from just this preliminary briefing in the Pentagon. Um, so yeah, I'll concede that point on the report, most likely not being represent of the of the notes because it seems to be in, in contradiction with the timelines. But he does in that interview, in that statement, describe the situation that seems to be indicative of the Admiral Wilson leaks in terms of this denial of access. And I do have to go back onto that fact that the, uh, the Admiral Wilson himself 
has only ever confirmed this briefing took place and denied everything else. So it just seems strange to me that Edgar Mitchell uh, would, you know, basically say that this is not the case, that there was a continuation, there was an investigatory effort on on behalf of a vice admiral within the develop within the uh, defense infrastructure. So, um, yeah, no, good point. Good. Uh, I, I like I said, I'm happy to be fact checked, and I want to be able to have a, an objective conversation about this. There's no inherent bias on my side, or at least I try not to be. Um, but I still think that there's moments in that statement that still seem to lean towards this being true, that the incidents that were described in the documents do seem to be represent of this statement of, hey, this guy went on after our briefing and started trying to find things, turn over stones and, uh, you know, was basically told to to go away. One last uh, thing that, that I want to... Uh just kind of get your comment on, and then I'll pass it to you. I want to make sure you have every opportunity to say whatever closing words you would like. I know it's getting late over there, so I appreciate you sticking around. Yeah, no um, and and it's the, the final, I think, concern for me to get on board that any of this can be legitimate. And it goes back to the security questions, which we've already talked about a little bit. But I want to kind of give a summary of what we have to accept when it comes to breaking security oaths by many of these individuals to accept that this is true. And, and this is where I want your reaction. We talked a little bit about Thomas Wilson himself being that J2, that he goes, he violates his oath you know, with Dr. Eric Davis. You responded to that, but I at least want to give that, that bullet point again. Uh, Greer also reinforces the violation of that oath per his speeches and a written book. So in essence, he's Um, because we're on the same page that the idea of these programs existing, should they exist, would be classified in nature. So all of this is being published by major publish houses, uh, including being said in public, classified information. Nobody's doing anything about it. Uh, Per the notes, we didn't talk about this part, but Thomas Wilson's aide had uh, told Miller that MJ-12 exists or an MJ-12-like group Uh, That in itself, again, it sounds like we're in agreement, would be essentially a classified in nature uh, idea. Uh, And the aide says, oh, we were denied access, but they're confirming it to Will Miller, who is not cleared. It doesn't matter if he has an active clearance or not. He likely doesn't have a need to know about an MJ-12-like group. Uh, Same deal with, you know, Eric Davis. No need to know. We, We talked about that. And lastly, Stephen Greer with his NRO list. Uh, and I'm hoping you can send me that document because I'm well, sure NRO. it's out there. The, the program, the NRO document that he talks yeah. about, I tried to find that and prep for this show and it's on, couldn't his find any. it's on his website. Then I, I must've missed it. So if you could uh, send that to me, but regardless, um, according to him, from what I was reading in his book and everything, they were secret code words, right? All right. So this was a leaked document, correct? Yeah. Okay. So a leaked classified document is flashed to the J2 and they confirm that it's real, which in essence would be a breach of classified information. Now, all of a sudden you have all of these, you know, secret code words and, and consp- uh, code words and project names uh, out there in the cosmos. Now I want to give one example and I want to throw it to you of why none of that to me is plausible. And this is in the public realm. Anybody can uh, verify this. A researcher by the name of Lee Graham, uh, s- very nice guy, very smart, has been at this for years. He's got to be in his 80s, maybe 90s now. But I met him about 25 years ago, and he had a uh, s- at least a secret clearance, maybe top secret, through Aerojet. And he was inadvertently given the code name uh, Senior Trend which was the classified at the time program name for the F-117 stealth fighter. Now, why I'm bringing this up is he didn't have a need to know, but he, he was inadvertently told that code name, highly classified program. What happened next was a nightmare for him. Huge investigation. He was forced to sign a classified document that said he would never talk about it, uh, that it was all a mistake and that he, uh, in essence, would have to forget about it. And it was then later declassified in 1990. So he was able to talk about it. What's my point? All of these issues that I have with this, in my opinion, is dismissible by verifiable fact. And Lee Graham, again, being that public 
uh, story that anybody can verify. And I'll, I'll put the document in the show notes as well. It's the, ver- the um, affidavit he had to sign. You know what hits the fan when classified information gets out. Even with those that have a security clearance, when they hear information like this, it hits the fan. Lee Graham is a verifiable example. So that's my spiel in that all of that has to be accepted as true. And all of that has to be the accept, the rare exception to the rule yeah. that I haven't seen anybody come back and say, hey, well, look, it happened with this or it happened with that or it happened with this. What is your reaction to that? And can you cite yeah. any high level security breach like this where the people that heard classified information just got away with it? So you brought up a brilliant point, and uh, you know I don't I don't personally know enough about the intricacies of uh, you know kind of like clearance bureaucracy and linguistics and how you can word things to know entirely why these kind of situations might have gone through uh, you know this this uh, this process and and almost been basically allowed to, to happen because um, you bring up a really good point, but I think that. Um, Oh God, no, I did have a train of thought on this because I was thinking about it while you were talking. That's, I'm keeping you up late, so I totally yeah, no, get it. I'm, it's, it's 20 to 1 in, in the morning right now. So, I'm so um, sorry. It's, it's all right. Don't worry. Um, and this is kind of like a, a very intensive question that I'm trying to wrap my head around because you're absolutely right to bring it up. Um, I think that one issue would be, and this is just me reaching, but uh, I think one issue might be that this is about UFOs and it's about reverse engineering and it's about one of the biggest secrets that could be potentially being kept. And so by bringing further attention to it, they may actually make it worse for themselves because by that point you're acknowledging it. So if you're going to press chart, because I mean, one of the things, <clears throat> and obviously we can talk about the credibility of Stephen Greer, but one of the things that he made a point of saying quite a few times over the years is because these things are operating in some sort of very murky level of, uh, you know, essentially illegal oversight that they're not actually bound by constitutional and you know kind of congressional governmental oversight procedures and standardized legal procedures so they're not actually operating in the legal zone that we know of and that by by virtue of that that kind of null and voids all of the security clearance restrictions on this type of issue if it's being managed in a way that's obfuscating uh, legal oversight or standardized oversight on a governmental level so perhaps there is actually a loophole with one of the most sensitive issues in the portfolio of the United States government, where it's so sensitive that if you if you're actually going to talk about it, it's best just to not say anything to these people or let them just kind of fade away into the into the madness of the UFO community, which has been destigmatized uh, stigmatized for so long and uh, kind of like you know put into the corner. So obviously, I am speculating here on the on the fact because. Yes, there are some pretty significant what you would imagine to be breaches of classified information. I mean, the, the notes themselves aren't classified because it's a it's a it's a document written privately outside of government. So the actual document itself is not <clears throat> stamped with a classification stamp. Obviously, the information is extremely sensitive and most likely does breach some level of national security agreements between the parties. But I think that perhaps it's not at the kind of level where they would actually make a point of, uh, you know, uh, arresting or putting criminal charges down on these people. There, there really could be the case that this is existing in such an obfuscated manner that it's just better to let people say something about this and ignore it than to press charges and kind of uh, solidify legitimacy for the issue. So, I mean, I think that that's one potential reason. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I do, like, I'm just a 26-year-old guy from the UK with no background in government, and I've picked up on all of this stuff over the past couple of years, and I'm trying my best to kind of formulate uh, structures that are based on something I've not been privy to in my life and I'm only just learning about now. So I'm quite happy to be shown to have a lack of knowledge in certain areas. But I do fall back on people, uh, you know, like uh, Ross Coulthard, who spent 
decades going through defense journalism and networking with people with security clearances. He's also a trained lawyer. He knows how to handle things confidentially, and he's quite versed on the intelligence communities. Uh, you know, Frank Milburn, former strategic analyst in British, uh, you know, special forces. Uh, Bob McGuire, the former founder of the Hume Center of the National Security and Technology Studies at Virginia Tech. Like, there's a few different people that seem to have a background in at least knowing what the procedures would be like and what can and can't be said, who are still quite happy to sit behind this and say, there's enough here for me to feel that this is actually a legitimate scenario and I'm willing to put my weight behind it to talk about it. So, um, you know, from, from my very layman perspective, I can only kind of grasp at straws as to the reasons why something like this would be able to escape the kind of claw of US bureaucracy and national, you know, national security uh, uh, implications. Um, I, I have to just fall back on uh, the knowledge that I know some of my colleagues have and, uh, and imagine that they're probably talking from a point of authority. So just like you've had people speak to you, it seems like there's differences of, of opinion, even within the intelligence community, even, even with people that manage the kind of uh, networks and structures that we're both talking about, there, there seems to be a difference of opinion. So this is why, for me, this whole situation falls back on the fact that it needs to be talked about, scrutinized, addressed, kind of kept in the momentum of the UFO conversation, and maybe we'll get further developments that can corroborate and confirm and, and give us uh, a good reason why something like this would escape. Because you, you, you're absolutely right to bring up something like this. These are these are the issues that need to be understood and addressed. How could something like this be talked about and these people are still roaming free? Um, I think that's an important question. I don't think I have the answer for it. Um, but I, like I said, I do fall back on some of the people I know that believe it's real and uh, and potentially the fact that this is actually so sensitive that they'd rather just not even acknowledge that these people are actually talking about a real situation and it will just fizzle out on its own, which it kind of has. I mean, you know, outside of the UFO community, who do, who knows about this? No one knows about the Admiral Wilson leaks. You know, I'd stop anyone in the street and they wouldn't know about it. So it has been suppressed very, very much so in terms of, you know, if, if this if this issue actually is real, I mean, the the you know, no pun intended, the gravity behind this situation is intense. If it's actually a real situation, this should be across every world media platform there is. Um, as we all know, in the UFO community, with much frustration, that is not usually what occurs. Uh, only until recently have we seen a sudden addressal of this issue in a modern context. Um, but when it comes to talking about stuff like this, especially legacy programs, I think we've all seen that there's no intention within this mainstream narrative we've seen adapt from 2017 there's no intention to open up the discussion of programs that might exist from the u.s government's perspective you know there's nothing in the uap report about investigating special access programs so um i think that this you know there is a potentiality for this to exist in such a, a, a an obfuscated level of government that it's barely even legal uh you know i think richard dolan calls it legal illegality so it's like you know it's on this it's it's so close to being absolutely unacceptable. So um, and, and 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 before I finish this thought off again, I, I would draw from other sources who have claimed these programs exist. Ab the Admiral Wilson documents isn't the only document, or it isn't the only situation which seems to be inferring that there is this uh, kind of a level of clandestine research and development happening in the black. So it's not the only situation that's pointing towards that. It just happens to be one of the more detailed ones. Um, so I think that I think that there are reasons to be skeptical about the documents. I wouldn't say that there isn't. Um, you've listed some very important reasons to have some skepticism, but it's not enough skepticism, in my opinion, to dilute the entire story down to nothing but a you know just a, a, a fugazi. It's uh, it's it's something interesting, and uh, and I think that it needs to be developed upon over time. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 having to kind of like word my way through this because I don't have a truly definitive answer as to why they were able to get away with saying these things and why they even thought of saying these things. But uh, I, I don't personally feel that it's just black and white. There might be reasons why that was able to occur, you know? Nothing Ooh. usually <laughs> is black and white. And that was, uh, no, that was, that was well said. And here's uh, my takeaway. And I want you to know this. I have a lot of respect for people that will step into the vault like this and know that we don't see eye to eye with this, 
but sit here for two and a half hours and have a conversation and walking away. Uh, you know, my respect level for you, uh, rose considerably, not that I was disrespectful going into this, but rather, uh, I wanted you to know how much I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and, and that I hope that this serves as a testament to those out there that maybe did go in the weeds, like both of us, you know, and I'll, I think I said it privately, but if not, I'll say it publicly, uh, that I apologize, you know, uh, for those social media battles a year or two ago. Uh, but how we've risen above that and, and can have a conversation like this, that has to happen more often. Yeah. So my hat's off to you for that. And I hope you don't stop asking questions. I hope you continue doing what you are doing, which I know you will. Um, but there needs to be more people like you out there that, again, I don't expect everyone to agree with me, but the fact that you listened <laughs> and the fact that you took the questions and, and gave them out as well, my hat's off to you. So I really uh, want to say thank you for that. That's really, really kind of you, John. And, uh, you know, I'd like to just echo back the same sentiments because, uh, you know, I, I, like I said before, I have a lot of respect for you with the work with the Black Vault, but we did have areas of contention on this. And uh, I, ha I, you know, I did my fair share of silly little snide comments and, and responses over Twitter. And I really, I'm really happy with how this has turned out. I will admit, I, I'm not ashamed to admit I was a little bit anxious about how this might go down between you and me because even though we did reach out or you reached out to me and we both you know uh, shook hands water under the bridge no problems you know because i'm not a kind of i don't like to hold on to grudges and no one likes to hold on to grudges um so i was you know a little bit like i, I hope this goes well but i'm really really happy with this i feel like we've both looked at this from our perspectives, we both agreed on certain points that seem to be, you know, mixed into is it real? Is it not real? And uh, I, yeah, I'm I'm really really happy with how this whole thing went down. And um, and I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to have this kind of conversation because uh, this this is exactly what we need in the UFO community. There's there's and, and I, I do think, as I said to you in the DMs, a lot of it does come back to social media. Social media is a brilliant tool. But it's it's also a pretty devastating weapon because it does create a a, a a much shorter fuse in our ability to deal with people, especially if you're a content creator or researcher and, and you've got a lot of people commenting and 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 you you can get quite dismissive quite quickly if you're finding yourself disagreeing with a lot of people about different things. So I think social media exasperates that level of the human mind, the ego, the reptilian aggressive fighting <laughs> mind. And, uh, and that's not always the true representation of a person. And I have to admit, this is the first time we've had a full dialogue between each other. And I have a, a much a, a much grander and a much clearer assessment of you as an individual than I did just having short, sharp comments between each other on Twitter. So I think that that can be a lesson for everyone listening is try and remember that, you know, on Twitter, on social media, people aren't always the way that they normally are. And you don't always get to give the most amount of detail, the best perspective. So try and take those types of interactions with a pinch of salt. And it's always good to have this kind of thing because it proves that we're able to have a calm, civil, you know, mature conversation whilst still disagreeing with each other, while yeah. still having moments where we don't agree with each other, but being able to finish it, which uh, I think we're going to have to do now, otherwise I might actually pass out. Yeah, um, no, that was, that was my, <laughs> that was my closing remark to you. And I wanted to make sure you had the last word. You gave a brilliant response before, but I wanted to make sure if there was anything else you wanted yeah. to add, you had an opportunity to do so. I'm just happy we did this, and I think it's been the best possible result that we could have hoped for, uh, you know, and I, I hope you agree with that. No, absolutely. It's a shame I didn't press record, so we'll have to do it all over again. But <laughs> no, uh, that, that, that said, get some much needed sleep. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Please yes. make sure that you, uh, that you give a thumbs up. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and also check out Jay's Project Unity, also linked in the show notes. Click on that, check out his videos, get all the information that you can, because he's got a lot on there about all sorts of topics, not just the Wilson Davis stuff, but quite a bit. Jay, thank you again. Thank you all for listening and watching. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.